Happy. Wendell and Birdie flip atop the order. Last night, Birdie hit first, Wendell hit second. They'll go opposite. Cooper and Aguilar will flip first base and DH. Brian De La Cruz gets a start in left field. Jacob Stallings a start behind the plate. Miami got shut out for the sixth time this year last night. They've lost two in a row, and Chris Bassett will do his best to try and make it three. We mentioned this is going to be his third start in a row against Miami. His first two on the 19th of June, six and the third, gave up three runs, and on June 25th, seven innings in Miami and gave up three runs as well. Friday night, so the Mets wearing their black uniforms. Nice. Can't wear black uniforms tomorrow when Keith's number is retired. You see the Alexis Mets starting defense in the third inning last night. Lindor made an excellent play uh, to save Trevor Williams off John Birdie. Thomas Tomas Nito with the great pickoff of Senzel in the Cincinnati game in his last start. And Brandon Nimmo probably made the best play he has made as a Met yesterday of Jesus Sanchez. Toyota numbers for Chris Bassett this year. His last eight starts. Two and three with a five and a half, but before then, spot on. Joey Wendell getting set to lead things off for the Marlins, who had won six in a row before they got beaten by Shohei Otani and the Angels on Wednesday, and then shut out last night by Trevor Williams and the Mets. Boy, what a performance by Williams! Who's going to go back into the bullpen now with Bassett coming back and Scherzer healthy and Degrom on the way? You know the way the season is going. You know I think uh, people that watch the Mets would find this funny, but he's become one of the more valuable pitchers uh, on the roster for this team. You know every team in the old days had yeah. a swingman, right? right? The guy who pitched second games with double headers, pitched in long relief. The the 2000 Mets had um, Pat Mahomes That's in right. that role, very successful doing that. It's Don Mattingly, whose team has uh, has played better of late, but right now three games under 500. Bassett's first pitch of the night to Joey Wendell is in for a call strike and we're underway. Wendell 0 for 3 last night. The Marlins had just two hits. In fact, they only had only two base runners, and one of them was erased trying to stretch a single into a double. That was Jesus Aguilar with his team down by 10 runs. Not the best play in the world. Wendell hitting a 287, missed a month because of a hamstring injury. And he fouls back Bassett's cutter, and it's nothing and two. Chris Bassett first outing in 13 days third straight start against Miami if you remember in the 2020 season because of the uh, Marlins COVID problems and the uh, game that was postponed because of a social justice protest Jacob DeGrom wound up starting four straight times against Miami. Mets won the first three and the Marlins finally got him the fourth time. And a fouls one at the plate this is the first time in Bassett's career. That he's ever made three straight starts against the same team. His next one, though, will be probably on Wednesday versus Atlanta. Yeah, that'll be a little different. Yeah. That's its last three starts 2.53 ERA. The previous five starts, 7.62. So he was trending in the right direction before he was shut down for a couple of weeks. Points at his ear, has a little trouble with the pitch calm. Now he and Nito. Are fully adjusted. And Wendell golfs one up in foul territory. Escobar hoping for a play. And gets there to make the catch. Nicely done by Escobar. Always important to run as far as you can to get there rather than try to catch it on the run. Yeah, because the ball, because of coming off the left handed batter, will always have the spin to come back and play. So you get as far as you can. To the dugout and then work your way back onto the field. Nice job by Escobar watching Bassett tap on his hat to try to get the pitch com going. It was almost the equivalent of kicking a jukebox. Piece of cake here for Joey Cora. He's saying Bassett has a little of the Fonz in him. <laughs> Here's John Birdie and he drives one out to right center field. Nimmo circles over toward it. And puts it away two out. So Birdie, as he did last night, swinging at the first pitch, he flies out. Nemo made maybe the best catch of his career last night against Jesus Sanchez. This ball a rocket over his head, just leapt at the right time, snow coned it, but still held on as he hit into the wall. What a play! 
So a very similar play last night made by the Cardinals Dylan Carlson in their win over the Braves. He was in the bottom of the ninth against Michael Harris and he went back into left center and made a similar type of reaching grab. It would have been the winning hit had he not caught it. And then Carlson was able to double the runner off first base. With a relay throw. <laughs> Garrett Cooper batting third in the inning. And I say that and, and we chuckle because we've seen Carlson make incredible throws from the warning track. Well he got Diorme remember trying to stretch a double into a triple when the Mets were trailing by a few runs he threw it all the way from the wall in St. Louis on the fly to third base. His play last night helped the Cardinals who wound up winning in 11 and finally beating the Braves on their fourth try. This is driven down the right field line and slicing foul. One and two to Cooper. So the Cardinals able to salvage the finale of that four game series which boosted the Mets to a three and a half game lead over the Braves. Atlanta's playing Washington this weekend while the Mets are playing the Marlins and then they hook up for just their second series of the year Monday night in Atlanta. Mets have 78 games to go after tonight 15 of them against the Braves. Cooper starts the day sixth in the National League and batting at 308. One two from Bassett. And misses outside with a fastball, two and two. Bassett's flat fastball is a little firmer tonight. You see the shoes. The Kawhi Leonard shoes. Sweet. He's no longer wearing the Venezuelan belt, though. He's gone with the black <laughs> belt with the black uniform. Two two coming. Well, you know, black goes with with everything, so. <laughs> it's very it's very good for us that are colorblind to stay with the black but the yellow would have stayed if it had more hits in it. That's right. He had the three home runs in three games with the Venezuelan belt but then he's gone two for 17 since thus the black belt tonight. Three two coming to Cooper and he got him with a high cutter. Bassett strikes out Cooper. He's got a one two three opening inning. That's come to bat with no score. Of work down there. You saw with a strikeout. It's your Geico Mets starting lineup tonight. Dom Smith in against the right handers. Tomas Nito gets the start after James McCann's big night last night. As the Mets face Pablo Lopez for the second time this season. We've talked about his great changeup. He's using it 37% of the time. At batting average against it is only 190, and he has 46 of his 93 strikeouts have come. By way of the changeup. Equally effective against left hand hitters and right hand hitters. Nemo leads off. Brandon over the last four games has seven runs batted in. He was one for three last night. Marte and Lindor to follow. Pablo Lopez has made three career starts at City Field. His ERA in those three starts is 12.15. That's almost hard to fathom. The last time he faced the Mets. It was on June 17th here about three weeks ago. And he gave up a three run first inning home run to Francisco Lindor. Remember that was the day Lindor's mom That's was right. watching him for the first time and Francisco had won 440 feet to center field. Yeah 13 and a third innings pitched here at City Field 18 runs allowed. So that put a crimp in Lopez's day that day and then Alonso had a grand slam later in that game. Full shift on against Brandon with two strikes. And he takes breaking ball low and it's one and two. But he is a good young talented pitcher. You feel at some point he's going to change that as you see the shift Wendell third baseman moves over to the right of second base. Interesting that Lopez's third pitch of the night was a curveball. He throws that pitch only four percent of the time. He has not given up a hit on that curveball this year. And he gets that ball in on the hands of Brandon and he's able to fight it off. Still one and two. Well, even though he's in the shift, Wendell's playing third base, not second base like last night, and that's his best position position. Stallings behind the plate. He was their big acquisition in the winter. And De La Cruz um, uh, plays really well against the Mets. Tore it up last year when he came over from Houston, not so much this year. Uh, by the way, DeGrom retired the side in order. Two strikeouts in his first inning. Struggling. Well, somebody, somebody actually put the ball in play, which didn't happen in his first outing. And Brandon fights off that fastball and stays in the at bat. So two in a row, right in on his hands. 
A lot of high targets, a lot of fastballs, a lot of fastballs in from Lopez. Almost like he's trying to have a little different game plan. Maybe not revealing that change the first time through the order. We'll see. Buck Showalter last night got another notch on his managerial belt. 600 and 1,603 wins past Fred Clark for mm. 21st all time. His next target is Ralph Houck. He needs 16 more to tie Ralph Houck for 20th all time. Cutter misses high and it's two and two. Lopez got off to a great start this year. In fact, he was National League Pitcher of the Month in April. His results have been a little spottier since, but the most important thing is to be able to stay on the field. Last year, missed big chunks of time because of a shoulder problem, rotator cuff, made only 20 starts all year. This is already his 17th start this year. And he misses away with a fastball and Nimmo having a classic first inning at bat. He's already seen seven pitches. Marte on deck. Mel Stottlemyre Jr. said that the reason Lopez is starting the games or the last few games from the stretch having a little problem with his hands getting in the right position and his arms been a little late. So he's been starting the games out of the stretch. That's it toward the middle of the diamond off the glove of Rojas he recovers but too late and Nemo is aboard. Well, Rojas alone on the left side of the infield got to it couldn't make the play cleanly it'll be an error on Rojas and the Mets have a lead off base run. Well a couple of errors in last night game last night's game by this Marlins defense opened the door for the Mets. And an error right off the bat from the shorthanded Rojas. Rojas had an error last night. So did Joey Wendell. So now here's Marte, who has been really hot and particularly has thrived in the first innings of games. This year, in the first inning, he's hitting 361. Only Paul Goldschmidt has a higher first inning batting average in the National League. And he takes fastball in the corner for a strike, nothing in one. Marte three for five last night now is a seven game hitting streak going. Ronnie mentioned how prevalent Lopez's use of his changeup is. Mets have been a particularly good team against off speed pitches. Well, maybe that's why he is not featuring it as much. Only one change up to Nimmo there. You can see their OPS on off speed pitches highest in the National League and that usage we talked about earlier. Just threw a change up to Marte that missed inside. It's a ball and a strike. Lindor waiting on deck. And Starling fouls back the fastball and it's one and two. A nice play by Jacob Stallings. That was like the old pitch back when you were a kid. Fired up against the netting and it comes right back at you. Does that count in his defensive run saved outs above average? Because you know that help helps you win the gold glove like Stallings did last yeah, year. Yeah, I'm not totally so I'm totally sold on Jacob <laughs> Stallings defensive prowess, but I'm not totally sold on the defensive statistics. They're coming, but they're not quite there. Now the way well I have a lot more faith in the uh, defensive run save statistic in particular for the seven position players. Yeah. But for pitchers and catchers yeah. it's a whole different story. Well I was looking at something today because I was trying to figure out the American League MVP race and defensive metrics have Jordan Alvarez as a plus three and Aaron Judge as a minus two. Come on. One two coming. That's pulled out a third a chance for two. Wendell to Birdie. And on to first to double up Marte. Hard hit ball, but right at Wendell for the 5 4 3 double play. Baseball is such a funny game. Things that can happen early in a game can change your whole attitude about what kind of success you have. That ball is hit right on the nose. If it's down the line, it's second and third. And he felt that it almost like a catcher did Wendell. He knew it was hit hard enough. All he had to do was knock it down and get it around the horn. 
That ball was hit harder than any of Marte's three hits last night. Right. So here's Lindor who hit the first inning home run against Lopez the last time that Lopez pitched on this mound. And he takes a cutter for a strike nothing in one. Hello. <laughs> Figured we'd show you some of the. Uh, was that the two? Uh, was that the, Was that the two box with the Grom? I, I don't think so. It looked like people were here. <laughs> You can always tell if it's 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 the Degrom game because you're looking through, um, you know, the mesh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the the extreme netting. You know, there's a reason why they call it the minor leagues. That's, that that is there the truth. St. Lucie batting there in the second inning, it would appear, after Degrom's one, two, three, first. and Lindor takes a cutter inside, and it's two and one. Your blue moon bright spot Francisco Lindor fifth in the league in RBIs Alonzo still first Alonzo hasn't driven in a run in nine games and he hmm. still leads the major leagues. And Alonzo and Lindor have more RBIs as a tandem than any teammates in the major leagues. He breaks his bat on that fastball in on him and he'll have to go back for a new weapon. They always have the bat ready you'll see the bat boy coming out. There it is. Same style bat. Pretty funny. The bat boy didn't hand him the bat. That was interesting. Alonzo handed him the bat. Yeah. The bat boy just took the broken bat. Gave the new one to Pete to give to Lindor. Hmm. Chain of uh, chain of command. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Supply chain. <laughs> okay. You know, we're still working on the supply chain. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Never ending. <laughs> two, two coming and Lindor got ahead of that one and fouled it off. It's interesting to, to watch Lopez when he tries to go up and in, which seems to be the game plan for Stallings and the Marlins and Lopez. He, he hasn't decided whether he wants to throw a true one in there or cut it because neither of them have really gone there. Uh, you the only putting a helmet on <laughs> because Lindor has pulled two into the bench so far. Yeah, but he, dugout. he should be able to catch him. He can catch bats. He can certainly catch foul ball. If he doesn't put the helmet on, he's not on our TV. He puts the helmet on, we get him on. You know, smart. You have such a great sense of social media presence. <laughs> Swing and a miss and Lindor out on a high fastball. And Lopez wins his way through the first inning despite a couple of hard hit balls. No score after one. Second inning, Chris Bassett facing Jesus Aguilar. Aguilar won for three last night. He was the guy who, in the 10 0 game, tried to stretch a single into a double and was thrown out by Starling Marte. That's grounded over the bag backhanded by Escobar bobbles momentarily and his throw pulls Alonzo off the bag and Aguilar is safe. They'll score that a base hit for Aguilar. For the best coverage in the game let's check out the T-Mobile coverage cam go back to that strikeout of Lindor. You know we were talking about Lopez really trying to throw the ball up in the zone see the target by Jacob Stallings up in the strike zone. Now he doesn't get it up and in like he wanted to with the cutter. It's up and away. But that was really the first pitch that he got up high enough where Stallings wanted it. And he got himself a strikeout. So you don't always have to hit the spot. Sometimes the height enough will be enough to get the strikeout. So the Marlins have the their first base runner of the night. Aguilar aboard. Jesus Sanchez the batter Sanchez 0 for 3 last night. Homeward against Bassett earlier this year and he takes a big rip at a fastball nothing in one. I don't get the press box I, I put that down for a base hit I'm assuming. It's a base hit. Okay. Aguilar a couple of days ago stole the first base of his major league career. I would imagine he's probably done in that department. <laughs> he's got a lead of about oh six or eight inches now he extends it to ten inches 
he and I are tied. <laughs> you had one stolen day. I just wanted one. That's all. And I got it. You know, I think that's true of a lot of players yeah. who, you know, are not involved in that part of the game. They just want one. And a curveball mm. follows Sanchez inside, and it's one and one. I believe it was against the Braves. I believe Paul Zuvella was the shortstop who caught it. And Bruce Benedict might have been the catcher. Atlanta many moons ago. And Sanchez lays off, and it's two and one. Sanchez has got a little soto in him, as far as uh, how he takes the pitches, and yeah, his uh, his knowledge of the strike zone isn't quite the <laughs> same quite as yet. Uh, Sixteen walks and seventy-four strikeouts this year, not quite soto-esque, <laughs> but he's got the move. If that's what you mean, he's got the move, and he's and he's got some serious power. He does have that. Another guy for this Marlins bunch right on his toe and turned in. Swing and a miss and Bassett with a high fastball takes care of Sanchez. Second strikeout for Chris one down in the second. Well just really threw it by him. We talked about it last night Sanchez to me it looks like he has a slider spin bat. You can attack that with fastballs up in the strike zone. Chris knows that. So one out and one on now obviously Garcia who was over two last night and continues to struggle through his first year with the Marlins after signing a four year free agent contract. So you saw that uh, Garcia took forever to get in the box Bassett was ready to go and then because he had to step out to give Garcia more time and you can see Bassett getting annoyed. And so Garcia wastes a little more time yeah. just to get under his skin. Yeah the gamesmanship of it all that should go away soon. That's it toward the hole and Garcia has an opposite field hit. Aguilar walks into second base. And the Marlins have two men on. They do a lot of walking on this Marlins team. They never did before I'll tell you that. I mean we, we always ad admired uh, the Marlins um, the last few years. They always played the Mets tough especially down at their place in Miami. And they always played hard. But they got a little uh, half step in them occasionally. In the series we have seen so far. That's a one six of the eight from the Marlins but Garcia picks up a base hit here to give Miami their first runner in scoring position with Brian De La Cruz coming up. De La Cruz hit a home run against Bassett earlier this season. And the first pitch slider in for a strike nothing and one. You know, Cruz picked up from Houston last year before the trading deadline for Yimmy Garcia, and he had a great run for Miami down the stretch. Hit 296, five home runs in 58 games. It's been a little more difficult for him this year, hitting just 216. And Bassett runs that changeup inside, and it's one and one. So if you're Chris Bassett, Ronnie, and yeah. you, you've been out for two weeks, and you know in his own description of it he had no symptoms at all during his stretch with covid so he was able to keep himself physically active he was able to throw he was able to run so how is that different or the same as coming back from an injury where you've been out for two uh, weeks well what happens Gary is you can't recreate what you do on the field also uh, Bassett, like many starting pitchers, it, and the breaking ball just missed, and it's three and one. It's a, a creature of habit, you know. He knows he's going to pitch every fourth day. That's been the kind of pitcher he is. So this is really going the way I thought it. He was going to have a lot of velocity in the first inning, which he did. But he's a guy who needs control. He needs to control four or five different pitches, and he's struggling a little bit with that here this inning. Definitely a touch guy. He finds the outside corner with the fastball, and it's three and two to De La Cruz. Miguel Rojas is hitting eighth in the order. He's on deck. 
Two slow runners on the bases with Aguilar at second and Garcia at first with one out. 3 2 coming, and De La Cruz reaches for the slider and fouls it off. Well, they announced the starters for the All Star game today. Nice. And it will not surprise you that there are no Mets in that group. Paul Goldschmidt beat out Pete Alonso for the starting first base job. Starling Marte was on the ballot, but Acuna, Betts, and Peterson. Jock Peterson? Peterson? Yeah, will be the three outfield starters for the National League. A couple of guys who will probably not be available for the All Star game were voted in as starters. Bryce Harper, who definitely won't, was voted in as the DH, and Jazz Chisholm, who probably won't, as the second baseman. Well, I have a news report. It's really a flash. Jacob DeGrom gave up a hit. <laughs> 3 2 to De La Cruz, and he rifles one to left field, but Canna moving back, and it's over his head. Aguilar around third. He'll come in to score. Garcia to third, and De La Cruz in at second base with an RBI double that beat Mark Canna, and it's 1 0 Miami. Well, it'll be interesting to talk to Mark tomorrow about this because off the bat, it looked like De La Cruz hit this with a lot of top spin. And I think he thought at some point it was going to settle, but it never did. It stayed in the air and beat him over his arm side, just out of his outstretched glove. And watch the back runner here. That's Garcia. Once he reads it that it's over, he checks to make sure that Aguilera is going to score. So he can go on to third. Aguiar, sorry, is going to score so he can go to third. And De La Cruz with the double. Now the infield comes in for Miguel Rojas, and he takes fastball inside. So that snaps a streak of 17 consecutive scoreless innings for the Mets pitching staff. Infield hit by Aguilar, opposite field hit by Garcia, and then De La Cruz with a run scoring double, driving his 22nd run of the year. Rojas won for two last night, had a double. Bats here with runners at second and third. And it takes a slider off the plate from Bassett, 2 0. So DeGrom, two innings complete in Daytona Beach, 22 pitches, three strikeouts, one hit. Austin Callahan, give him credit, hit the double against DeGrom, and we'll tell his grandchildren about it. His phone will be blowing up. He never makes it to the major leagues. Austin Callahan has a double against Jacob DeGrom. 2 0 coming. And that's on the corner of strike. Mm. Rojas didn't think so. But Phil Cuzzy rang it up and it's two and one. Interesting. 3 1 fastball taken by De La Cruz. Now 2 0 oh fastball taken by Rojas. I wonder if they're sitting soft ahead in the count. Here's your crew Phil Cuzzy, the crew chief, Mark Ripperger, Shane Leibensparger, and last night's home plate umpire Corey Blazer at third. See the. Um, some frustration on Bassett as he and Nito are having a hard time hooking up right here. And the curveball drops in for a strike. And he gets even on Rojas two and two. Spot where Bassett could badly use a strikeout. Got the number nine hitter Jacob Stallings waiting on deck. Humid evening, sweat pouring down. 2 2 coming to Rojas up and away in a full count. Good try there by Bassett trying to get the strikeout on that fastball that comes back over the plate. I'd expect him to go back to what he threw on the 3 1 pitch, that beautiful curveball, 2 1 pitch, beautiful curveball to get it back even. Three two to Rojas. Mm. Round ball to second. The runners will hold. McNeil throws out Rojas two out. No contact play with Avisil Garcia at third. A very slow runner. And so he stayed put and that's the second out. Well credit Bassett. I was wrong there. He went with the fastball beat Rojas. And he had to know there that if it played by the infielder that Garcia was not going anywhere. Although. Judging from that conversation that happened after the play, 
with his third base coach Al Padrique. I think that Garcia was trying to tell Padrique that he thought the pitcher was going to be able to handle that ball and that's not why he ran. Wow. He was he was kind of pointing in that direction saying I thought it was closer to the mound. Maybe try to explain why he didn't run. Your Stallings taking up an in ball one. That's a, a pretty bad read there. If that's what he was yeah, saying. That's, I, that's, I, that's saying. just yeah. trying to interpret what that conversation was. Because normally you know you, you run unless you think the pitcher can handle the ball. On a contact play. Stalling sitting just 194 but 298 with runners in scoring position and he takes a curveball for a strike. Well you said it right there Gary. He said Stallings is batting 194. Any you have to have a contact play there. The worst that happens is you get in a rundown and you will still end up with second and third with two outs and Stallings up. One one from Bassett and Stallings takes curveball outside and it's two and one. All right, so here, here's the two box. Okay. You can watch Garcia. You know what? That was a little closer than uh, than I thought. I thought it was a, a easy read that the ball was to the second baseman, but you know Bassett falls off that way, so I could see that he might have read it that way. And Stalling swings through the fastball, two and two. And Bassett. With an escape cat hatch here to try to allow just the one run. Twenty sixth pitch of the inning coming up. And the curve ball bounced toward third, a foul ball. Tonight's City Community Home Runs fan of the game is Linda from Wayne, New Jersey, former Little League World Series champion. Go to <laughs> SNY.TV slash CHR to enter. Good luck, Linda. Back when we were kids. Yeah. Boys from Wayne. Won it all. Craig Kornfeld. It's their big hitter. I think he worked for the Mets for a while. 2 2 on the way, foul back. Craig Kornfeld? I believe that was his name. Probably beat some teams that were corn fed when you get to those Little League World Series. Hard working inning for Bassett, who had a very easy first inning, retired the side on just 11 pitches. But he's given up three hits and a run, and now two and two to Stallings. And he wouldn't get him to bite on that breaking ball, and it's three and two. Joey Wendell would be next. Sending his cost of uh, Bassett about to throw his 40th pitch here in the second inning. Eighth pitch of the at bat coming from Bassett to Stallings. Ground ball to Lindor. Ignores the runner and makes the play. Side retired. So Bassett able to limit the damage with a couple of ground balls. Marlins get one and lead one nothing. Up to Dom that that the green tea will be forthcoming. The warm and fuzzy. I don't do that well. Gary. <laughs> Here's Pete Alonzo leading off the second with the Mets down one nothing. And Pete takes a fastball for a strike. Pete had a frustrating night last night. He went 0 for 4 amidst the Mets' 10 run outburst. It's been an interesting stretch for Pete. He had a four hit game the night before where he hit three absolute seeds. And then a tough night last night. He's now gone nine straight games without driving in a run, which is startling. And chases a changeup, and it's nothing in two. You'll see only three changeups in that first inning on the 19 pitches. We told you already over the course of this year, he's thrown it 37% of the time, so less than half. He's, he's got a game plan not to reveal it early. McNeil and Canada follow behind Alonzo here in the home second. And Pete gets another changeup and fouls it off. So we, uh, we gave you a smattering of the National League All Star starters. Here's the full list Wilson Contreras. The catcher, first base Paul Goldschmidt, second base Jazz Chisholm, third base Manny Machado, shortstop Trey Turner, 
Ronald Acuna, Mookie Betts, Jock Peterson in the outfield, Bryce Harper the DH. Hmm. So those are the starters voted in. And the American League stars. Alejandro Kirk is your catcher. Oh, great. Vlad Guerrero at first, Jose Altuve at second, Rafael Devers at third, Tim Anderson at short, Shohei Otani the DH could also, you know, pitch or play out outfield. Yeah, Aaron Judge, Mike Trout, Giancarlo Stanton, the three outfielders. Hmm. No Jordan Alvarez. He's probably the best player in the league right <laughs> now. Oh and two to Alonzo. And that one looked like it might have crossed up Stallings on the curveball. One and two. You know, it's interesting. Stallings has a kind of a he's a big man, tall man, has a very wide approach when he's catching usually the secondary pitches from Lopez. And he really over accentuates when he wants that ball up in the strike zone. I think that part of that is Lopez has a hard time throwing it upstairs. And Alonzo just got a piece of that to stay in the at bat. Another change up away. You don't see pitchers throw glove side change ups as much as Pablo Lopez does. Because they can't, most can't locate it there. It's a very difficult pitch to get all the way on the other side. Its natural tendency is to want to go away from the left hander down and into righties. But Lopez has perfected it to keep it outside. And Pete lines one, but right at John Birdie. So he finally got a fastball and hit it hard, but Birdie right there to grab it for the first down. That's four batters for the Mets. Three balls put in play, and the three that have been hit have all been scalded. Mm. So the Mets, when they are taking swings, are hitting the ball hard against Lopez. Now Jeff McNeil. One for three last night. That's a five game hitting streak working. No overshift against McNeil. It's four for ten lifetime against Lopez, and Pablo misses high ball one. And you can see he's thrown that change up more and more mm -hmm. since he first came up in 2018. Made his big league debut against the Mets the end of June in 18. Now his eighth career start against New York. And McNeil golfs one to center field. Sancho started back, now eases in. Two out. So Lopez retired the first two in the second. And now Mark Cannon will bat. As we mentioned hard hit balls, right? Marte, Lindor, and Alonzo, all three hit the ball 105 miles an hour or harder, hmm. all into outs. Cannon had a couple of hits last night. Marlins play a shift against him. And Lopez misses outside ball one. Cooper way off that line though because we know especially with two strikes Canna can go that way pretty easily when he's on top of his game. There's a good sinker from Lopez, and it's one and one. Canna with 30 runs batted in, one of seven Mets who have driven in 30 or more runs this year. It ties for the most of any National League team. So they have spread it out. Did they see where the Braves have seven players with 10 home runs already? Yeah. Cut her in for a strike, and it's one and two to Canna. I mean, 15 more times these the Mets play 
the Braves. It's going to be quite a quite a summer. You know that first game in Atlanta on Monday is supposed to be Scherzer against Freed, which would be a you know a matchup yeah. of aces. But Max Freed, when he came out of their game last night, was complaining of uh, gluteal tightness. So I don't know if he's going to be pushed back a day or something. And then last night. Spencer Strider pitched, so the problem Mets will probably see Strider on Tuesday. All he did last night against the Cardinals was strike out 12 and in six innings. We saw him last year out of the bullpen, right. making the transition to starting. The Stallings staring at the hitter, Canna, before he gives the sign on the pitch com, making sure he doesn't peek. I mean, all catchers do that. It seems oh, that Stallings do it a lot, does it a lot longer. He than does most. it a lot longer than most. Yes, maybe he has reason to. Who knows? But Pittsburgh paranoia. Two-two <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> coming. And kind of rifles one down the left field line. That's going to go into the corner for an extra base hit. And Mark Canna pulls into second base with the Mets' first hit of the night, a two on double. I believe this is a changeup from Lopez. If you look at Stallings, first though, the side swing, I like how that high leg kick is connected to the hands going back. He was a little out in front of that double down the left field line. I thought it was a change of registered at 91, so maybe just a bad fastball or cutter. But Canna still hit that out in front and off the end, but kept it fair. So the Mets have the tying run in scoring position with two down, and Dom Smith will step in. Dom coming off a big game in Cincinnati on Wednesday. And he takes a change up off the plate for ball one. Uh, Jacob DeGrom's third inning got the first two out. Gave a back to back singles, finished the third. No runs, three hits, no walks, six strikeouts in three innings, 36 pitches, 29 strikes. So I would assume that that's going to be all for Jake today in his second rehab start. So. I would say Jake is well on his way to Cy Young honors in the Florida State League. And now there might be some bigger fish to fry. Maybe he can make the all-star team down there. Well he's done great against the hammerheads and the tortugas. Let's see what other wildlife he can contend with before he gets back to the big leagues. Dom's played 12 games since coming back from the minors hitting 321 in that span. Another good changeup by Lopez. Steady diet for Dom, and it's one and two. Yeah, six doubles, three RBIs. Good pitch, good arm action here from Lopez. And that movement out of the zone catches Dom Smith. We talked before the game, J.D. Davis, that big game yesterday, get Dom Smith going, and then maybe you can turn around that DH position and how much it's been producing. Eduardo Escobar would be next. Well, Dom's been uh, hitting a lot of doubles during this hot streak. Still looking for that elusive home run. <laughs> We're just two weeks shy of a year since his last home run. And the fastball off the plate. Good eye, and it's three and two. Mm. July 21st last year in Cincinnati, 258 at bats ago. I think it may be Cincinnati would be the place where he break it and he hit a couple of balls well there that went for long doubles but still in the ballpark. Canna at second with two down three two coming to Dom and he takes ball four three two changer from Lopez that missed and the Mets have two men on first walk given up by Lopez. Well with Escobar struggling from the left side that almost was 
not a pitch around at all. But on 3 2, he was not going to take a chance with Dom. Threw that change up out of the zone as Mel Stottlemyre Jr. will come out to talk to his young right hander. This is a surprising visit, yeah. don't you think? I mean, he he's certainly not struggling by any means. Well, listen, I, I mean, the pitching coach knows his pitcher better than anyone, so there might be something he knows about Lopez in these situations that he needs to maybe calm him down. But uh, very surprising. You know, in this situation, you would think that Lopez knew exactly what he was doing with Smith there with Escobar up next. You know, we talked about in the beginning of the game, you know, that DH position, you try to shore up your holes in your offense. DH position could certainly do better, especially if Davis and Smith are manning that DH position the most. The nine hole, you could do a little better job um, for the Mets offense. And of course, Escobar is a guy that has not hit the way he's capable of yet. It was a very emphatic monologue by Mel Stottlemyre Jr. Well, he's got, uh, he didn't want to cross his dad as well. Here's Escobar, two out and two on. 0 for 4 last night and takes a fastball for a strike. And maybe it's just about being more aggressive. You know? I mean, when you have a great changeup like Lopez, you can understand why you might want to mm. dart around the strike zone. Escobar two for five with a home run against Pablo Lopez his countryman and he takes low and inside a ball and a strike. Had to be a tough visit for Mel Jr. though last night he made that visit to his pitcher Castano next pitch three run home run to McCann. Canna at second Smith at first with two down. And Escobar had a good swing at the fastball and fouled it off one and two. That's the last two nights with runners in scoring position, 10 for 26 after a long stretch of struggling in those spots. Pete's staying comfortable. <laughs> Lopez ahead on the count one and two. And Escobar fouls one away. So both pitchers now on both sides into their 40s with pitches in the second inning. Twenty sixth pitch of the inning coming up for Lopez. Eventually. No, Alcan is always biting a little more than uh, he tries to get a little more and a little more off second base. Has about as good a secondary lead as any of the base runners for the Mets. Rojas keeps his eye on him, then backs away. And Escobar tried to hold, but he went around. Strike three. Lopez throwing the curveball. And he gets Escobar to end the inning. One nothing Marlins. Like he sought him out. Let's circle back to the conversation yeah. they had before he faced Escobar. First pitch curveball from Chris Bassett misses to Joey Wendell as we start the third. One nothing Miami. Wendell fouled out to third base his first time up. So Jacob Degrom is indeed done after three scoreless innings in his second rehab start. 36 pitches, no walks, six strikeouts, three hits, and said he felt fine. Said he was happy to complete three innings. And now he'll get in the car and drive to Deland, which is only about half a half an hour from Daytona. Was he got 11 strikeouts and five innings down there so far, just trying to get in shape? 11 in four and two thirds. Four and two thirds. Yeah. Wendell just got a piece of it. And it's one and two. I didn't see anything about radar readings tonight. I guess because they were on the road. I don't know if they had a. Uh, a strict radar gun going on him, but you know he was throwing 101 the first outing in St. Lucie. Whatever it is, as long as he's feeling okay and can take the next start, the next step, yep. and keep his progress going, figure two more minor league rehab starts, and then he should be good to go if each one goes well. 
One hopper grabbed by McNeil and he throws out Wendell one away. It's three straight ground ball outs for Bassett. Got a couple in a big spot in the second after the Marlins had a run in and second and third and one out. Got two ground balls to get through that inning. Now he gets Wendell start the third and here's John Birdie. You know I don't know if it matters as far as DeGrom's plans and it'll depend on schedules and such things. Does it matter if you face double A or triple A hitters at, at when you're making those rehab starts. Uh, not for not for Jake I wouldn't think so no. It's a matter of getting his work in uh, work in um, bodies up there that he doesn't know uh, feeling the adrenaline as he goes out there. I think that's the, the key managing the adrenaline. Birdie flat out to center his first time up. You know, for those folks who always think they might be able to get a hit off a major league pitcher, this is how quick you have to be to try to get a hit off a major league pitcher throwing 95. That's how quick you have to make the decision. One, where is the pitch? Two, how fast is it going? Three, am I going to swing at it? And four, is it spinning or not? You got to decide all of that in that instant you just saw. And Good jo luck. And Joey Wendell did all those things, and he made very poor contact. He made very poor contact because it got up on the barrel a little bit. Good pitch by Bassett. But I mean, as hard as it is just to make contact, imagine then doing all those things and getting it on the barrel. <laughs> Bassett misses high to birdie, and it's two and two. It's essential to keep Birdie off the bases these days because every time he gets on, he's stealing in a way that he never has before. And Birdie chops one past the reach of Bassett, but there is McNeil to throw out Birdie, two out. So guys we, we just showed that angle from behind the catcher what it's like to actually be a big league hitter with the ball bearing down on you. Brandon Nimmo told me that he was watching a game on TV during spring training and he said you know that actually doesn't look that hard from that angle. He said I know it is I know what 98 looks like but on TV when the ball's going away from you if you're just watching you don't realize just how fast it gets on you in the box. A major leaguer watching it still said ah. That's a lot easier looking than it actually is. Well, his his major league brain is tuned into 95. For someone like myself who hasn't been in a box in forever, that looks crazy fast. Hey, um, aren't you Steve Gelbs? Uh, let me check. Yes. Okay. Why? Because you just your voice appeared out of nowhere. You weren't introduced, and all of a sudden, this disembodied voice was on our TV. Well, they uh, they had. My lower third that said Steve Gelb. So if you were watching, you knew. And I don't know, Gare, at this point, my voice should be enough. Voice? Don't you think? <laughs> wow. People know. You'd be like Madonna soon, just one name, you and Prince. <laughs> just Gelbs. <laughs> oh, shattered bat. In comes Escobar, throwing on the run and gets Cooper. Bat exploded into about a million pieces. Explosion. And Cooper is retired, and so is that bat and all the other pieces of it. It's going to be a lot of housekeeping to do after this. Wow. Tomas Nito leads off in the home third against Pablo Lopez. Nita goes after a changeup and misses, and it's one and one. Well, Ronald Acuna just broke out of a slump with a 446-foot yeah. home run. Oh. Braves lead the Nationals six nothing in the third. You said he's one of the starters, right? He is one okay. of the starters. I mean, he, you know, he missed significant time at the start of the season. 
but I don't think that matters to the voters so much. Wendell fields the ground ball and throws out Nito for the first down. You know, it's that old conversation about what should the All Star game be? Should it be a reward for career excellence? Should it yeah. be a war reward for half season excellence? Should it be whoever the fans want to see? Well, I believe you should be rewarding the players uh, that have had outstanding first halves, and there should be two legacy All Stars that can be picked so the fans can see them. And I think they're going to do that with Pujols and Cabrera, right? right? Well, just to play devil's advocate, okay. okay, if the All Star game is a reward for players who've played well for the first three months of the season, what reward do players get who played well the last three months of the season? Right? Because you've yeah. seen guys who have good first three months go to the All Star game and have bad second halves. Right. Right? But what about the guys who had great second halves? Hang with them. Yeah, well. <laughs> I think there's there's got to be some balance somewhere um, between first half performance and overall performance over the last several years. Well, you know, I'm not here to criticize, but I, I found it very difficult to understand how the voting went. Right. Well, they had that shouldn't be the case, should it? No, they have they have runoffs. Think of it as a runoff system. It's already too complicated with a runoff. You know, you don't get 50% of the vote. You have to go into a runoff. You've seen that happen before. Steve Kornacki has, has educated you about those things. <laughs> yes, he has. <laughs> in fact, we need him. Yes, we do. More than ever. Nimmo gets one in the air to deep right field. Back goes Garcia. Back near the wall, and it's out of here. Brandon Nemo ties the game with his eighth home run of the year. His third in the last five games. Nemo homers on a no two pitch and he ties the game at one. You know the period in the at bat where he's down 0 2 where he's shortening up and just trying to put the ball in play. He hits one in the upper tank. 0 2 is supposed to be a fastball in. Don't forget, he saw at least four fastballs inside his first at bat when Rojas made the error on the ground ball and he hits this one in the upper tank. The walks have dried up for Nimmo because the pitchers are pitching him more aggressive. But he's an intelligent hitter and he's reacting by swinging the bat more. And Mets home run made City will donate $2,000 to No Kid Hungry to help fight childhood hunger. Now more than ever, kids across America need our help. And the Mets have hit some balls very hard in the first three innings against Lopez, and they finally get some recompense on Nimmo's home run. Three home runs, eight RBIs now for Brandon in his last five games. Marte grounded into a double play on a hard hit ball his first time up. Trying to get inside cutting that ball in 0 2 and that quick bat of Nimmo. Marte drives one to right field Garcia is not going to get it it's going to go to the wall. Marte pulls in at second base and the Mets have back to back extra base hits. Starman goes the other way for his 18th double of the year. Well this ball was hit so hard and like you said Gary there's been a lot of hard hit balls off Lopez in his first three innings. But also Garcia plays a shallow right field so there's no way for him to get on an angle to even get close to that ball and plays it off the wall for a double. Short, choppy, quick steps of Marte. Here's a side swing. Almost hits it out of the catcher's glove. Hits that at, right at the plate and drives it to right field. Marte now has an eight game hitting streak. Mets up the go ahead run in scoring position with one out for Francisco Lindor. And Lindor swings over a curveball and it's nothing and one.
never recommend uh, runners stealing a base when left-handed hitters up because the catcher has a free reign. But Wendell is so far off third base. If Marte ever got a big jump, that's hard to go that far and make the catch and apply the tag all at the same time on a road runner like Marte. Back to back curveball from Lopez, something he rarely does to get ahead on Lindor 0 and 2. Alonso on deck. Let's have three hits in this game against Pablo Lopez. All three have been extra base hits. Two doubles and a home run. Lindor down in the count 0 and 2. And he hits this one on the ground down to first. Cooper makes the play. And gets it to Lopez for the second out. Marte moves to third. That was a change up to Lindor to get that out. Season 37%. Now it's starting to jump up a little. From 16, doubled it, over doubled it to 35% in the second inning. Alonzo hit the ball hard his first time up, lined out to the second baseman, Birdie, who was playing in the shift. This time they are not shifting against Alonzo in an RBI situation. Interesting. Hmm. Marte the go ahead run a third with two out. And the first pitch curveball misses. So Lopez throwing his curveball tonight more than he just about ever throws it. Well, he struck out Escobar in the last inning for a big out, a couple of Lindor to get ahead. And he tried to get ahead with Alonzo there, but now 1 0. Nine game RBI drought for Pete. Trying to snap that in this spot with two out and a runner at third. That RBI drought of nine games, the longest of Alonzo's career. And Pete swings through the fastball. One ball, one strike. In fact, Pete's last RBI was so long ago, it came against the Marlins. <laughs> June 26th, he had a run scoring single against Miami. And yet he still leads the major leagues in RBIs. There's your change up grip. It's a chopper hit to short cut off by Wendell and he makes the throw on target to get Alonzo and that retires the side. Mets get even on Nimmo's home run. Mets have gotten Chris Bassett even with Brandon Nimmo's home run. Jesus Aguilar leads off in the fourth. Aguilar scored the Marlins run after an infield single in the second. Bassett has gotten five ground ball outs from the last five batters. And he gets the slider on the outside corner for a strike 0 and 2. Aguilar then Jesus Sanchez and Avi Garcia for the Marlins in the fourth. Aguilar slices one to deep right center. Back in the gap goes Marte and he plucks it away just before Nimmo arrives. And that's a dangerous looking first out. Mm. Well, that was a good abort uh, from Nimmo there. The ball was slicing. So Marte knew at some point that it really was going to be better for his play. He calls it off. Nimmo gets out of the way just barely. After watching Jurickson Profar and oh. C.J. Abrams collide in that game yesterday for San Diego, Abrams was going out and Profar was coming in, and Abrams' knee hit Profar right in the jaw, and uh, they eventually had to cart Profar off. Diagnosed him with a concussion and a cervical strain. Mm. We hope he'll he'll be okay shortly. 
He says Sanchez struck out his first time up. The Padre team's dealing with a lot right now. And looking to drop down a bunt. Sanchez did it the right way. He didn't run up, just trying to place it up the third baseline, but he couldn't do it, and it's 0 2. He was trying to be too perfect. That was the only mistake he made. He did everything else right. Squared around, had the bat out front, and then he tried to make it perfect instead of just get it past the pitcher. That's all you have to do. It's more hard than placement when you have this kind of defense. Lay him down, Ziggy. <laughs> and Sanchez down on the high fastball, same way Bassett got him the first time. That's his third strikeout. Well, we've borne witness this year to a veteran pitching staff that likes to talk pitching, and it certainly has had an effect this year on Chris Bassett. I would say I probably have learned more this year already than I have in a long time, um, just based on. Um, how to pitch um, each hitter, what pitches work. Um, if you throw this specific pitch, what you should kind of attack with next. Um, so yeah, I think I think Max has been unbelievable. Um, but I mean, I, I feel like everyone really has. You know, it was uh, interesting to talk to Chris. It was almost like uh, every pitcher now has gone into the uh, uh, the Max Scherzer uh, professional school of pitching, uh, which I think is. Uh, fantastic but I but I also think and Chris alluded to it when we weren't on camera that he's had to really tutor a lot of young pitchers in Oakland Lion and Alonzo plucks it out of the air and that retires Garcia to end the inning so he did a lot more of the teaching one one game as we go to the bottom of the fourth Jeff McNeil leads off against Pablo Lopez who's had to throw 60 pitches to get through three innings. And he misses high with a fastball for ball one. McNeil flied out to center his first time up. Canna and Smith to follow for the Mets. Each team with a run on three hits. Jeff began the day third in the National League in batting. And he takes a strike one and one. It'll be interesting when the All Star reserves come out. And now that the Mets have been shut out of starters. Mm. To see who gets a call. Alonzo, McNeil, Marte, Nemo, all you would have to say are deserving as position players. I think Diaz is a layup as far yes. as pitching it goes, and Taiwan Walker certainly should have a chance as well. All those guys I think are legit candidates to make the team. Yeah, since uh, they didn't get any starters, I think they're going to get. Uh, Two or three to four representatives, I think, from this ball club. In fact, they've had too good of a year. Well, at least now you know it'll be done fairly, right? Because yeah. uh, the players get a vote and then um, the league fills in from there. Used to be that the reserves were all chosen by the manager. Right. And of course, the manager is uh, Brian Snicker. His team won it all last year. And Buck said, you know, when he was. Managing, and he was managing the All Star team. He said, when there was a a 50-50 call, he always took his own player. Why not? Lined into center field, a base hit for McNeil. Chased down by Sanchez, and McNeil's going to try for two. The throw to second base, not in time. Both De La Cruz and Sanchez moved slowly toward that ball that was hit between them, and McNeil took advantage by taking the extra base. We talked this entire game about Lopez trying to be better at throwing that high pitch against this Mets offense, trying to get some swing and miss, but it's hard for him. He lives down to get that ball high enough in the strike zone. That miss caused this base hit to left center, and they're calling each other off instead of being really aggressive and going to get the ball. So McNeil read that, and he's watching the call off and knows that Sanchez is running to his right and has to throw back to his left almost an impossible throw. 19th double of the year for McNeil. Mets have four hits in this game and they've all been extra base hits now against Lopez. Canna had the first one a double down the left field line in the second inning. And Mark looking to bunt with everybody playing back. 
Did not offer at it. It's ball one. And Wendell was playing very deep behind the bag, and Cooper was deep at first base. I like that just to show it. Even if you don't want to bunt, has to bring in Wendell, and he's come in three or four steps. Ain't got a chance to hit it by him. Yep. They continue with three on the left side against Canna. And Mark takes a fastball at the letters. There's the high fastball, one and one. You know, the hit by McNeil. Now, when it gets in the outfield, you don't really call another outfielder off with the ball on the ground. You do that with the ball in the air. Ball on the ground, you just bust it to get there as quick as you can. I mean, it was perfectly placed, right? It was yeah. equidistant between De La Cruz and Sanchez, which is what caused whatever confusion there was. The reason I say that Gary though if you're a runner what you're doing when you come around first is you pick up the outfielder so if you bust to the ball if the first thing you pick up is that Sanchez is close to the baseball you call the jam off you shut it down but if he if he's if no one's in the vicinity then you turn it on so you just got to get to the ball as quick as you can just to alter what they see. Neal at second and nobody out. And kind of dribbles one foul on the change up two and two. We were talking earlier about Lopez and his curveball usage for the season. He's thrown his curveball four percent of the time tonight, thirteen percent of the time. So he's tripled the usage on his curve. A pitch he has still not given up a hit on this year. And maybe that's why. But he's decided to go away from his strength to pitch to maybe the Mets weaknesses that doesn't always work out. And can is hit by the pitch change up that whacked him in the leg. That is the tenth time this year that can has been hit he takes over sole possession of the team lead. Number fifty eight for the Mets. And they've got the first two men on. Got hit right in the back of the left leg. Well, Canna comes by it honestly. He's tied for the American League lead in getting hit last year. So 27 times 27. hit last year? Yeah. So he's way behind his pace with 10. <laughs> you know, people say, well, I get hit by a changeup. It's 87 miles an hour. It still hurts. That's all right. That's all right. I think. I think once I might have said something like that when Jamie Moyer was pitching all those years ago. I said it was a changeup, and somehow it got back from the Phillies clubhouse. They said, "Hey, Jamie said he want to come out and hit you with a changeup anytime you want to." <laughs> he was right. I was wrong. So the first two men aboard for Dom Smith, who drew a walk his first time up. McNeil at second, Canna at first. And Dom hits a slow ground ball. Rojas with a crossbody flip gets the out at second, but not at first. Nice play by Rojas just to get the force on Canna for the first out. But that gets the go-ahead run to third with one away. Had to throw this behind him. Difficult throw, difficult angle for Birdie to get it. I I, w I wonder right now if they are delaying the game to take a look at the slide to see if Canna had a legal slide in there because everyone in the infield was stopped and waiting for the bench of the Miami Marlins. It was a perfectly legal slide. He went down early and did not slide past the bag. He just happened to upend birdie. It was which, a we, which we don't see anymore. Perfectly legal slide that looked awkward. Because we never see it. Right, because you never see it anymore. This used to happen, you know, five times a game. This is a beautiful slide. Exactly what you're supposed to do. Never lifted his arm to try to impede. He just, his body let his natural movement of his slide and body get into the uh, infielder. So now first and third, one out for Escobar, who struck out with two men on to end the second. And he takes the first pitch change up down and away for ball one. If he had lifted his left arm up into birdie, it might have been called. Right. 
Escobar trying to get a runner in from third and less than two out. It's been a problem for him this year. He's been successful only seven of 16. That's 44 percent. Major League average is 54 percent. McNeil is that lead run at third. I pull in on his hands. He had nothing to do with that, but foul it off, and it's one and one. Mississippi Queen. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Leslie West and the boys. Mountain? <laughs> Another high fastball and Escobar swings through this one and it's one and two. Game three of the series tomorrow. Yeah there's a big ceremony and all that but there's also a game Mets and Marlins. Coverage begins at three o'clock tomorrow. Ceremony starts at about three thirty. Unveiling Keith's number 17 right next to Jerry Kuzman's number 36. Get to see Keith in a suit and tie and make a speech and maybe shed a couple of tears. We might. Also, Escobar goes down swinging. That's the second time that Lopez has gotten him with a curveball, and that's a big second out for Pablo Lopez. The two high fastballs set it up, though. He's able to finally elevate those two fastballs and finish Escobar off with a curveball down. In such a year of fits and starts for Escobar. He had that great series against Texas when the Mets were home last weekend, homered in all three games. But he's gone just two for 19 since then, and he's stranded four runners tonight. So he leaves it to Nito with first and third and two out. Tomas grounds it out to third base his first time up. Right before that pitch, Joey Wendell crept in about four steps at third base. Hmm. Thinking, well, maybe Nito would try to bunt for a go ahead hit. Wendell has a great feel for the position. Heads up player. Not creeping in this time. And Nito takes one of the dirts. Stallings able to smother it. And it's one and one. He's got that wide stance. He has, does not have a knee down, so it makes it easier for him to drop both those pads down, his knees down, big target, and catch that right in the chest protector. That was a classic move. You don't see it as often anymore. Like Tony Esposito. There you go. And Nito gets tied up. Did he swing? He did not. First base umpire Mark Ripperger gives him a pass, and it's two and one. Jacob Stallings, Gold Glove winner last year with the Pirates, acquired in a trade for three players in the offseason. Miami wanted a stud defensive player back there to handle their young pitching staff, and Stallings has been that guy. Their pitching is their greatest asset. And Nito takes a big cut of the fastball and comes up empty two and two. Well Lopez has only given up one run. But he's about to throw his 80th pitch working in the fourth inning. So the Mets have worked him hard. The Mets offense when it's been at its best. These are the kinds of games they've had against starting pitchers. But the Mets are 0 for 5 with runners in scoring position. And now Lopez trying to get out of this inning. Two and two to Nito. And he struck him out. Side retired. Mets got a leadoff double from McNeil, but he's left stranded. 1-1 one, one after four. And 108, maybe? Wouldn't want to quote me. Brian De La Cruz flies one into deep right center field. Back goes Nemo with Marte in the gap, and it's off the wall. Karam gets away from Marte, and De La Cruz pulls in with his second double of the night. So Brian De La Cruz, who had been the last man to reach against Bassett, goes after his first pitch of the fifth inning and hits it off the fence in right center. And the Marlins have an instant threat in the fifth. 
De La Cruz continues to hit well against the Mets. This one lifted. Thought for a second it was going to be a home run. Hits the middle of the padding and gets by Marte. Not a bad pitch. Down. And he went down and got it. So that's the fourth hit against Bassett, who had retired eight in a row. And now Miguel Rojas, who grounded out his first time up, trying to at least advance De La Cruz. And he takes a fastball on the outside corner strike. Game of baseball is funny, right? The Mets have a leadoff double, they can't score. Right back at him now. The Marlins have the same situation. Fifty second Avenue and Corona Avenue. Fifty second Corona. Okay. There's a good curveball by Bassett to get ahead on Rojas 0 and 2. Bassett can throw you 95. He can throw you 71. Got some really uh, good looking shoes on the field tonight from Pete. Rojas going with the uh, cotton candy look. Lindor. Oh, Lindor every night. Escobar. <laughs> Fastball high to Rojas, one and two. The and Kawhi of course, Leonard. the uh, Kawhi Leonard uh, look for, this Pete's. for Escobar. Hmm. What do we uh, call that exactly? Uh, the Convergence by Jackson Pollock. <laughs> it's a little too monochromatic for Jackson Pollock. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like Arctic camouflage. Like uh, you know, camouflage or more like a. Surat like pointillism maybe. Now you're gonna have you're, you're gonna get me trying to parse Mo Monet and Mane. <laughs> Curveball outside to Rojas and it's two and two. You know Yale has its own Vince Scully. Vincent Scully, <laughs> please. <That's right. laughs> Master at Morse College. <laughs> there you go. Sounds like your sister must have been. Yep. <laughs> she was a Morris girl. Two and two to Rojas with Jacob Stallings on deck. And the curveball outside. Nito thought about throwing down, but nobody came over to cover. I mentioned that when we were doing the defense. I really enjoyed watching Nito pick off Senzel at second base in Cincinnati. On the bunt play. He likes throwing the ball. He does. He's always ready. That's it. Nods agreement to whatever Pitchcom says in his hat. Three two coming, and it's taken the other way. A base hit for Rojas. De La Cruz will be held at third, and the Marlins have runners at the corners with nobody out. Well since we've seen Rojas in Miami he's always had this ability to hit the ball the other way doesn't matter if it's away or it's in let's see overhead where this ball ended up well that's kind of middle away so the Marlins threatening to grab the lead back first and third and nobody out the number nine hitter Jacob Stallings the batter. Stallings grounded into a double play his first time up. De La Cruz at third, Rojas at first, Mets back at double play depth. They'll concede a run to try and get two. Rojas runs about five steps towards second and holds as Stallings takes a cutter for a strike. Stallings five out of seven this year, getting a runner home from third with less than two out. That's really good. Mm. You mentioned earlier he came into the night hitting 298 with runners in scoring position despite his low overall average. Bassett misses away with a slider and it's one and one. Bassett's first start in 13 days since he beat Washington on the 25th of June. Tested positive for COVID-19. Had to stay on the shelf until he passed the protocols. And when he came back yesterday said that if he tests positive again he might not let anybody know that's not recommended mm. broken back grinder down to first Alonzo will have to make the play to first 
and gets the out there. He was looking De La Cruz back the whole way. De La Cruz never had any intention yeah. of breaking, but if Pete feels that cleanly, maybe he has a chance to get the out at second. Well, a lot of broken bats of the Marlins off Bassett tonight. This one, another one to Pete. Watch his eyes come up just to catch De La Cruz to see if he was going. I think Pete was just really intent on the runner at third. And remember, he's had a play like that before where he threw wide of second base. So just wanted to make sure of the out. So now second and third and one out of the Mets will bring the infield in with Joey Wendell up. Tie game fifth inning. Wendell's 0 for 2 tonight. Fouled out and grounded out. And he flies this one out to right. Not all that deep. De La Cruz will tag. Marte's got the great arm. Here comes De La Cruz. Here comes the throw by Marte. It's up the line. And De La Cruz comes home with the go ahead run. Sacrifice fly for Joey Wendell. Scores De La Cruz to make it 2 to 1 Miami. Rojas went to third on the play. Well it was set up perfectly. You thought that with the big arm of Marte he just did not get enough on it. That ball usually you'd see just one hop to the plate but a couple of hops and offline as well. So De La Cruz challenged him and won the challenge. They've challenged him three times they've won twice. Rojas beat him last night. Aguilar did not. <laughs> so two out in the runner at third and here's Birdie. Who's fly down and grounded out. So Joey Wendell getting the job done with a deep enough fly ball for his 14th RBI. And Birdie chases a slider and it's nothing in one. And Wendell makes this team a very different looking team, right? I mean, Chisholm's out, which hurts them in terms of some power and some flash. Soler is out, which certainly hurts them in terms of power, but Wendell. Gives him a very solid player in every respect, and that time able to get the run in. And the other thing that's happened with all the injuries the Marlins have had is it's led to John Birdie basically becoming an everyday player, yeah. which he was not earlier in the year. Birdie played left field last night, second base tonight. You have to be cognizant, even with two outs, of the bunt by Birdie. I know he's been hot and he's done well against the, the Mets, but he's that kind of player, you know? Well, they are not looking for it. Both corners are back. One and one count. And he swings through the fastball, and Bassett gets up in the count one and two. Chris Bassett has struck out three tonight. And this is up and away to birdie two and two. The Braves having themselves a field day against the Nationals. Home runs by Acuna and Olsen and William Contreras. Eight to two in the fifth. Braves three and a half behind the Mets starting play tonight. Two two coming. In the air, shallow left center cutting in his canna, and he makes the catch on the run, and that retires the side. Marlins take the lead on Wendell's sack fly, 2 1, halfway through. Time around the order for Pablo Lopez, who has thrown 80 pitches through four innings, but he's got a 2 to 1 lead now. Brandon Nimmo took him deep last time up for the Mets' only run, and he starts him off this time with a fastball for a strike. Nimmo reached on there in the first, hit one into the front row of the second deck. In the third, his eighth home run and his third in the last five games. Nemo Marte and Lindor, third time around the order against Lopez. Last night, the Miami starter Daniel Castano only made it through four innings. So the Miami bullpen is a little hard pressed right now. They play the shift against Nemo this time. With Wendell alone on the left side of the infield. 
And Brandon takes a change up down. Two balls and a strike. Pablo Lopez, 26 years old. Part of a very talented young starting core for these Marlins. If they can ever get them all healthy at the same time, they could have the makings of quite the pitching staff. But even with all the comings and goings, they are third in the National League in starters ERA. Waiting for Jesus Lazardo to get healthy and Cody Petit and Sixto Sanchez and it's been Lopez and Alcantara who have been leading the way. Two two to Nimmo. Slices one out to left. Over comes De La Cruz. And that's the first out of the inning. Tomorrow the Mets will send Carlos Carrasco to the mound. Coming off an outstanding start his last time out. He'll go up against lefty Braxton Garrett. And then on Sunday final game of the series it'll be on picks 11 Taiwan Walker who has been the steadiest Mets starter all year up against Sandy Alcantara who could be the starting pitcher in the All Star game. Here's Marte who doubled down the right field line his last time up. That's a bad doubles in each of the last two innings only to leave a runner stranded and a call strike nothing in one. That's are 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position. Lopez has yet to have a 1 2 3 inning. You know you're talking about the talented young pitching staff of the Marlins but you know, if you think about it how many times did the Mets go through their Noah Harvey DeGrom Mats and Wheeler how many times did they once go, once once wow one time they had those five guys start in a row one time because that's the way it goes right because yeah, right. you get one guy back and somebody else goes down that's just the way it goes. Especially in today's game with all the velocity. You just hope to have enough depth to be able to plug the gaps when you have to. And that's what the Mets have done so well so far this year. They have. With from from game one. Right. Well, McGill on opening day. Yeah. Right? Peterson's done a great job. Trevor Williams, especially last night. And uh, all those guys will be called upon again at some point, even when the Mets have them all healthy. Marte goes down swinging good fastball away from Lopez. That's his fifth strikeout. And he's got a chance for his first one two three inning of the night. We check in with Steve. You know Gary we, we talk about analytics all the time and it's such a, a broad term. There's so much information out there. So we thought it would be interesting to talk to a lot of the players about what piece of information they find most useful. So Francisco Lindor the thing that he looks at is movement on the pitches both vertical movement and horizontal movement. The vertical movement essentially tells him where he should swing. We heard this out of Brandon Nimmo as well right. Depending on how much ride someone has on their fastball for Lindor it's 18 inches or more. If it's 18 inches or more he swings above where he perceives the pitch to be coming in. If it's 18 inches or below 18 inches then he just trusts his eyes. In terms of horizontal movement that determines when he swings. So if a guy's got a lot of horizontal movement if the pitch looks like it's coming down the middle he lets it go because it's most likely going to be a ball. If it's coming closer towards him he knows it'll probably end up over the plate a sweet spot for him to swing at. Hmm. The question is how do you process all of that yeah. in, in four tenths of a second. Yeah because it's it, you know for pitchers that's why they've got the most out of all this stuff it's proactive you know you can take it and, and insert it into your game where you see fit for the hitters it's always knowing all that stuff but how do you react quick enough and I will say this Gary because it's something that he knows going into the game going into the at bat 
I think in some respects the choice is already made. He doesn't need to decide that in that you know, split second. He knows against this particular pitcher if he sees a fastball he's going to swing above that fastball and he knows where he's looking for the ball out of the pitcher's hand to determine whether or not he's going to swing at that pitch if he feels like it's going to be in the zone or if it isn't. Hmm. Hooked on the ground down to first and Cooper makes the play. And beats Lindor to the bag and so Lopez has that elusive one two three inning and he's got himself a lead two one as we go to the sixth. We go to the sixth inning two to one Miami Gary Cooper leads off against Chris Bassett. And Cooper takes curveball for a strike nothing and one Cooper is struck out and grounded out 0 for two. Mentioned it last night Cooper tonight playing his 73rd game of the year. He's 31 years old. The 73 games is the second most he's ever played in a season in his major league career. You know the DH position is right now allowing him to stay healthy and on the field and that's a good thing. Never been able to stay on the field for a full year. But he and Aguilar splitting time at first base and DH and that's been the perfect formula for them. And I wonder going forward with the Mets whether they'll have more of a split like that with Alonzo and Tom Smith or whether they'll continue to have Pete have the predominant number of games at first base just in terms of keeping Pete fresh for the latter stages of the season. So Dylan Floro up in the Miami bullpen. I think Lopez is uh, done uh, because of the number of pitches through five. Ninety three pitches he's thrown. And Cooper gets a breaking ball and flies it toward right center slicing in his Marte and he gets there one out. So one out and nobody on we check in with the studio for a game break brought to you by your local Honda dealers Maria Marino go ahead. He had been in the slump. That'll break your slump. 446, did you say? Yes. Wow. You saw him celebrate at home plate? Well, he's got the whole thing, and then he has, uh, uh, imitates a lot of NBA players' moves as he moves between third and home. Well, when you say he has the whole thing, I think I'm, what you're trying to say, he's got the whole world in his hands. Yes, he does. <laughs> but he's got a LeBron move. He's got a. Curry move. He's got a couple of different moves. Well, oh, Escobar's got Kawhi Leonard shoes. There you go. Spider Mitchell comes to visit here every now and again. <laughs> That's right. Big Met fan. Dad works for the team. Got to get him a little closer. Well, people are working on that. We got <laughs> our people talking to their people. <laughs> One and two to Aguilar. Well this is a, a heads up Escobar is having a rough night at the plate so he has changed his belt and his shoes mid game. No more Kawhi Leonard shoes and he's gone back to the Venezuelan belt. How about that. <laughs> but most players will tell you they're not superstitious. Oh every ball player is superstitious that I ever met. The guys who aren't super superstitious say they aren't superstitious because they are superstitious and they keep saying it because to say you were superstitious <laughs> would break the superstition <laughs> exactly it's like 12 dimensional chess <laughs> Aguilar had an infield hit in the second fly down in the fourth one for two and he and Bassett in a little game of cat and mouse and Phil Cuzzy says let's go guys pitch clocks coming next year and the curve ball popped up. And Aguilar not happy, and Alonzo grabs it. Well, that's as loud an exclamation as we've heard on our field mics all year. That'd, that'd be Jeff McNeil. I know what that meant. It doesn't matter what language it was said in. <laughs> you know what's interesting is is Miles walking off the we field. We have seen there. so much of this from the so Marlins. I, um, Miles Michaelis just went through it in his last start that he felt. He was ready to pitch and the Braves hitters kept calling time and getting out of the box. So you see that the pitchers are trying to be a little more assertive getting this thing moving. 
Friday, I'd like you to try to explain. Yeah. Because a lot of people watching will say, who cares if Aguilar is walking off the field? It, explain why it matters. It, ju it just looks bad. Part of being a, a professional ball player at this level is running on and off the field. It's always been thus. Now, you know, you can say or, or people can argue that it doesn't matter. You know, it's just it, uh, with a game that has no action anyways, and now you're going to have less action and walking around the field. It, it's just not professional. And I think, unfortunately, ultimately, it reflects back on the manager and the respect players have for the manager, yeah. and that tends to bleed over into other areas that do affect the game. Listen, one of the players that uh, Mets fans love is Brandon Nimmo. Why do you love him? Because of the way he runs on and off the field, the way he runs to first base, puts his head down when he hits a home run like he did tonight, and goes around the bases. Now you've got the back and forth now between Bassett and Sanchez. So three different hitters. Taking exception to Bassett working quickly. Curve ball hit on the ground down to Alonzo. Bassett has himself a very strong inning as he sets down the Marlins 1 2 3. And now the Mets will go to work in the bottom of the sixth down by a run. Up and sitting by the sidewall <laughs> watching everybody else. Exactly. I'm, I'm, a, uh, I'm the <laughs> coat guy myself. Everyone just drops the coat off where I'm sitting. <laughs> Do you watch this, Ronnie? Yeah, I got it. Dylan Flora will pitch the bottom of the sixth inning for Miami. Well, we saw that ERA it was a little inflated when we were down in Miami, but Flora's been pitching better. See, it has come down some. It's been a big part of this bullpen for the last couple of years. Part of the uh, Dodgers 2020 World Series team. He'll face Pete Alonzo, Jeff McNeil, and Mark Canna in the bottom of the sixth. It's been a frustrating night for the Mets offense so far. And a frustrating couple of days for Pete, who's 0 for 6 in this series. Three infielders on the left side against Alonzo, who leads off in the home sixth. And 4 0 pours a fastball in for a strike, nothing and one. Pablo Lopez went five, allowed a run on four hits, one walk, five strikeouts, a hit batsman, a home run, 93 pitches. And now Flora trying to protect the lead for him. Generally, if you can get into the Miami bullpen, you got a little better chance than you do against their starters. It's not a bad bullpen, but it's just their starters are the linchpin of this team. Pete is 0 for 3 in his career against Floro. He's pitching his second year for Miami. Fastball velocity down a couple of miles an hour from last year. And Pete floats one on the right side right to Cooper. One out. Jeff McNeil coming up. You know we talk about pitchers all the time Gary and repeating your motion. Well it's same for hitters. They're trying to make sure they're doing the same thing. Last night and tonight. Watch the front leg first. Back leg second. So here's the swing. Watch the front leg almost in sync with tonight's front foot and watch the back foot come off the ground all at the same time and both hits look to me like they were both stroke to left field. One he caught more in front so his body was lower. One he caught a little later his body was up but the, the legs are the same. McNeil had a double to left center leading off in the fourth. Mets couldn't get him around. It's been a theme in this game tonight. Pounds that one into the ground on a change up nothing in one. Jeff's now hitting six straight games with his double. Batting average up to 318 on the year. And the fastball away from Floro, ball on a strike. So it's interesting. Stallings with Lopez never went down on one knee down. Gave a little higher target, especially he wanted a lot of pitches up in the zone. And Floro, he knows, can only be effective if he's down in the strike zone. So the way for him, a tall man, to give a lower target is to put that knee down. It's fascinating that a catcher would adjust his stance based on the pitcher. It's amazing because uh, the catchers I pitched to had kind of one way of doing it. 
it's their way or the highway. But uh, these catchers are are more Tony Pena than Gary Carter. And McNeil goes down swinging on a fastball. So he set him up with change ups, blew him away with a fastball, and Floro's got his first strikeout, two away. This is just one time that a pitcher just caught a hitter looking for something soft and rushed it by him. You said that his velocity has been a tick down, but when you surprise a hitter like that, it looks like you're throwing 95. So eight straight Mad hitters have been retired, and now Mark Canna, the last man to reach when he was hit by a pitch his last time up. Yeah, I wonder why Phil Cuzzy's out there. Don't know if this is about substances. Apparently not. Phil took charge. Can has reached in both his plate appearances tonight a double and a hit by pitch. And he takes a slider out of the strike zone for ball one. Mets haven't had much luck against Dylan Floro as a Dodger or as a Marlin. Can is 0 for 2 in his career against him. And a fastball off the plate 2 and 0. Oh, so he went uh, uh, to the rosin bag, and then he started uh, really rubbing it into his forearm or wrist, and because he couldn't see it, so he wanted to ask Dylan what he was doing. Satisfied with his answer. What would be the possible thing that he was looking for? Well, I, I think maybe to see if he was trying to hide maybe a substance that he might be using. Uh, all he was trying to do is put enough rosin on his uh, forearm because you get really sweaty in there and the combination of sweat and the rosin uh, will make it a little tackier. And a fastball down the middle for a strike three and one. Dom Smith would be next. Well presumably if he turns his back the second base umpire should be able to see what he's doing. Yeah. And Canna takes one just in off the plate. Paul Fork. Mark wasn't sure. Looks back at Cuzzy. Makes sure that he got the call. And Canna's on base for the third straight time. Drew Smith up in the Mets bullpen. Chris Bass has thrown 89 pitches through six innings in his first start back from the injured list. SNY wants to send you on a trip to Universal Orlando Resort where you'll experience the action thrills and adventure of three incredible theme parks plus stay at Universal's Cabana Bay Beach Resort. SNY's Fan Flyaway Sweepstakes presented by M&M's. Go to SNY.TV slash Fan Flyaway and enter today. Tying run at first with two out. Here's Dom Smith. He's walked and grounded into a fielder's choice 0 for 1. Three infielders on the right side against Dom. And he takes a change up for a strike from Floro, nothing in one. Drew Smith up. A nice time for Dom Smith to break that, what he's got going. Give the Mets a lead. You mean the home run drought? That drought. 259 at bats without a home run? I'm superstitious, so I didn't want to say it. Well, I thought you're not supposed to mention things that you do want to happen. Well, well, I was talking around it. You you went for the specific. Come on. Is this still a Band-Aid on the apple? Or did somebody just drop a piece of paper in there? I don't know what it is. It's been there since the last homestead. <laughs> oh, 2 coming. And Dom flies one to shallow center, and on comes Sanchez. And that retires the side. So Dylan Flora puts up a zero in the bottom of the sixth, keeps it two to one Miami as we head to the seventh. 
Now they say Garcia leads off in the seventh against Bassett. Garcia's hit the ball hard twice, a base hit to right, and a line drive to first. And he chases a slider from Bassett for strike one. Bassett coming off a one, two, three, sixth inning. He's done his job tonight. Mets offense, though, has not. They've squandered a number of opportunities. The only Met run coming on a Brandon Nimmo home run back in the third. Garcia gets curveball and hits it down to third. And Escobar swings it across. One out. One out and nobody on. Brian De La Cruz coming up. We check in with the studio again. Maria Marino's got another update. I think Jake is going to take that net home with him from Daytona Beach. <laughs> uh, it's a good look. Brian De La Cruz takes curveball out of the strike zone. De La Cruz has been a huge thorn in Bassett's side tonight. He drove in the first run with a double that went over the head of Canna in left field. He scored the second run after doubling off the fence in right center. And a curveball that misses, and Bassett falls behind 2 0. Drew Smith has been warming in the bullpen, but Bassett pushing toward 95 pitches. Staying in to face his nemesis tonight, De La Cruz. If you go back to Bassett's earlier starts against Miami this year, De La Cruz is now four for six with a home run Ooh. and the two doubles against Chris. And now he's behind him 3 0. Miguel Rojas waiting on deck. And there's a strike three and one. Remember that home run to hit off Bassett? It was a fastball in, I think, on a three two count after a lengthy at bat. And that's on the corner, and it's three and two. Well, when De La Cruz came over last year from Houston, all he did was rake. <laughs> Played great in the outfield. I mean, he was a one man crew for a Miami team that was going nowhere. 3 2 coming. And a check swing roller foul. Badly fooled on that curveball. Well, he wanted to check swing it. He would have went around, but the ball made contact. Bass has thrown as many as 110 pitches in a start this year. And with two full weeks off, he has plenty in the tank tonight trying to get through the seventh. Three two coming. And that's drilled down the left field line. And De La Cruz has his third straight extra base hit. He pulls into second base with yet another double off a beleaguered Chris Bassett who was able to thrive against everybody else tonight but not against Brian De La Cruz whose three doubles are half of the Marlins hits. He'll hit a first a fastball in his first at bat for a double and now his last double comes on a slider on a 3 2 pitch. And yeah, that's all for Bassett 99 pitches. In his return to the mound, and he'll exit after six and a third. Drew Smith coming on, called to the bullpen, brought to you by Nissan Shop, NissanUSA.com. Drew Smith in to face Miguel Rojas with a runner at second and one out. And his first pitch slider on the corner for a strike, nothing and one. Drew going through a little rough stretch right now. His last two appearances, giving up four hits and three runs and two home runs. 
That last outing in Cincinnati on Monday, he gave up four bullets, two of which were right at fielders, one of which left the ballpark. And Rojas fouls back the high fastball, and it's 0 and 2. It's a little change for him coming inside to the right hander. Rojas had an opposite field single after De La Cruz's leadoff double in the fifth. That led to the go ahead run for Miami on a Joey Wendell sack fly. So George Brett Pintar right there. What's the limit 18 inches up your bat you're allowed to have Pintar. Yeah no longer than the width of the plate right. Well, that's got to be close to the limit right there. Luckily Tim McClellan's not here. Well. Yeah, it's a good thing because, you know, George with that wild look in his eyes, <laughs> you never know what might have happened. One and two to Rojas with Stallings on deck, and it's hammered foul outside third. Nice play of the carom. Halterless. Tough skin. Tough skin. Pitcher can't use any substances, but boy, can the hitters. <laughs> yes. One, two coming. Rojas slashes that one foul. Not even good for the environment with the aerosol can. I mean, come on. Saying they should at least go to the pump spray. There you go. <laughs> no chlorofluorocarbons. <laughs> oh, you don't want to read the ingredients. <laughs> I think I saw stuff like that in Breaking Bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> One two coming to Rojas and he hits it on the ground right near the bag. It's a fair ball smothered by Alonzo from his back. He gets the out. Oh wow. Rojas says he's safe. But Mark Ripperger called him out on a ball that was hit about 20 miles an hour it seemed. Alonzo somehow got to it and threw from his back with Smith covering and the Marlins are going to challenge the call at first base. Well the ball had such spin on it that somehow worked its way fair. Great job by Alonzo to get to it on his back. He makes the throw. Miami is challenging the out call at first base. You know in the fence of the umpire at first base if we show that one angle again behind Rojas Smith the ball and Rojas all were in the same line which really gave him no angle to look at the play and you don't really hear that bang bang you're supposed to hear at first base when the runner slides the call on the field is overturned the runner is safe Miami will retain their challenge so it's an infield hit for Rojas. On an incredibly softly hit ball. I we didn't see on replay how how fair this yeah. ball was or how it stayed fair. But I mean clearly Rojas yeah. was safe. That that's the view I was talking about that made it difficult for the first base umpire to have any educated call on it. So that puts runners at the corners with one out. Jacob Stallings at the plate. And Drew Smith with a mess to contend with. Let's see if we can see whether this ball was fair or foul. Yeah, it was foul for a long time, but it had all that spin on it. And maybe it hit the line right behind the bag. Hard to tell. Not a reviewable play anyway. Fair or foul in front of the umpire. You know that from Cincinnati. Ground ball should be two. McNeil with the flip. Lindor with the turn. Double play side retired. Just what Drew Smith needed to get out of the top of the seventh. Stretch time at City Field with the Mets down a run. By four at Wrigley Field leading up to the All-Star break. Anthony Bass into pitch for Miami as we go to the bottom of the seventh. It's been a rough night for Eduardo Escobar so far. First batter face number is great for Bass. It's in the second year of a two year contract he signed. He has always struggled against the Mets. Six and a half ERA in 17 games. 
Escobar came up with two out and two on in the second and struck out. He came up with two on and one out in the fourth and struck out. Changed his shoes, changed his belt, hoping to change his luck. And he drives one to center field, chasing Sanchez back a few strides, but he's there, and he puts it away. Better at bat for Escobar, but he flies out for the first out in the home seven. Braves are cruising tonight. They lead the Nationals 8-2 in the seventh. Charlie Morton still in there for the Bravos. Phillies are starting a series in St. Louis tonight. They're eight back of the Mets. No score in that game in the third. Here's Nito, who's grounded out and struck out 0 for 2. Mets have dominated the division so far, 25 and 9 against the National League East. Mets are 21 games over 500 for the year, 16 over 500 against the division. One and one to Nito. The Marlins have that division record thanks to a 12 and 1 mark against Washington. 10 and 14 against everybody else in the division. Well, Washington's only won seven games in division. And Nito lays off the slider, stopped in the time, two and one. Brandon Nimmo's homeward for the only Met run tonight, standing on deck. Anthony Bass, the third pitcher of the night for Miami. Pablo Lopez went the first five. Dylan Floro a hitless sixth. And Nito fouls one away on a fastball, two and two. Marlins have played a ridiculous number of one run games. They are 14 and 17 in one run games this year. And if you take the one run and two run games, they've played 43 of them. More than half their games have been decided by two runs or fewer. Nito just got a piece of the slider to stay on the at bat. No one run game last night, but here we are tonight. Last night was really an aberration for the Mets this year. There have been very few games where they have put it away early, made it easy. Had somewhere they put it away late. <laughs> two two coming, and Nito takes a fastball just off the plate, and it's three and two. The walk is not a big part of Tomas's repertoire. He's drawn seven walks this year. That was a good take though on two and two. He's had only one career at bat against Bass, 0 for one. One out and nobody on. Wave going on. And Nito takes strike three call. So Bass able to find the corner with that fastball and there are two out. Congratulations to tonight's City Community Home Runs fan of the game Linda who as of now has won a Mets autograph and Mets prize pack to take back to Wayne New Jersey. With the Little League World Series title. Don't forget to receive 25 additional entries by donating five dollars or more to No Kid Hungry. So here's Nemo. Who accounted for the Mets run by poking one into the front row of the second deck in right field in the third inning, his eighth of the year. One for three on the night. This is the right guy for Nemo to face. He's four for four with a home run against mm. Anthony Bass. Well, the home run was on an 0-2 pitch. Cutter from Lopez. That's short stroke of Nemo. Hit it in the second deck. He's on a little bit of a home run tear. Three in his last five games now. Change up misses down from Bass. A ball and a strike. It's not quite ownership. I think you need ten at bats to claim ownership. Like uh, Devers and Cole. Right. 
Eric Yelding and Frank Viola. I think he was 10 for 11. Something like that. Uh, Matt Williams and Ron Darling. I think he had five really? hits total. All left the yard. Howard Johnson and Todd Worrell. I think it was five home runs and nine at bats. And big moments, right? Had to be. Whitey stopped bringing him in <laughs> to face Hojo. Had enough. He stole his bat. <laughs> Three and one now to Nemo with Marte on deck. That's happened out of hit since the fourth inning when McNeil led off with a double. They had a host of opportunities over the second, third, and fourth innings against Pablo Lopez, who was able to get the big out each time. Now just looking for opportunities against the Marlins bullpen. Three and one to Nemo. And that catches the inside corner. It's three and two. Max holding court. Day ending in Y. <laughs> Grip on his slider. 3 2 coming. And Nimmo slashes one foul. Vino waiting for his hat. And Craig Bjornson. Got to put the pitch com in there. Okay, here's your hat. What's your hurry? <laughs> three two from Baston Nemo. And that's strike three call. So both Nito and Nemo get called out on that three two fastball. And Bass has a 1 2 3 bottom of the seventh. On we go to the eighth. 2 1 Miami. Runs. The Mets have not. Nemo's home run, the only run for New York. Brian De La Cruz with three doubles. First game in his career with three extra base hits. He's been involved in both runs. Top of the batting order for Miami in the eighth against Drew Smith, who came on to get a double play ball from Jacob Stallings to get through the seventh. Wendell drove in the go ahead run with a sacrifice fly in the fifth, otherwise 0 for 2. And Smith quickly ahead of him 0 and 2. Chris Bassett, 6 and a third, two runs, six hits, no walks, three strikeouts, a home run, 99 pitches. And over his last four starts now, since that rough start in San Diego, Bassett has a 2.60 ERA. Slapped down to third, retreating as Escobar, long throw against Wendell, speed, and he got him! Boy that was a tough play for Escobar playing off the line had to give ground and then get rid of it in a nonce and he was able to get Wendell. Well the key was got it with one hop and got rid of it quickly. A little skip. And a close play at first base. And the Marlins will not or will they challenge the call. They've already won one challenge on a play at first base and it appears they are going to challenge this one as well. I think he got him. I think he was out. What do you think? I think he was out as well, but this might be where a manager's protecting his player, right? If it's close enough. It's late. They need to run. There's a lot of uh, reasons why to check this. Maybe it'll go your way. Phil Cuzzy's having a little trouble with a dropped mic IFB issue. Uh oh, it's lost in the shirt. Yeah. We've all had this problem in TV. But it's new for the umpires this year. This whole wire in the shirt thing. He's got it. There you go. Nice recovery by uh, by Phil. He's going to make sure it's still connected. Miami is challenging the out call at first base. Okay. Got the first part of the play. Yep. Let's see. We'll have a better, great view here. Pete with a good stretch. I don't think you can overturn that. I don't think you can either. The call on the field stands. The runner is out. Miami will lose their challenge. I see some daylight right when that ball was in the glove of Pete. Jim Reynolds and Adam Hamari, the replay crew chiefs, 
Helping with that call. Phil Cussey, electronic mastermind, <laughs> making the announcement. And it's one out on the top of the eighth. See how clean that was? I love it. it went all, quickly. All the way down to the Jersey accent. Oh. Now Birdie ducks out of the way of a curveball, and it's ball one. Birdie's gone 0 for 3 tonight, 0 for 7 in this series, which seems really weird for Birdie in two games against the Mets. <laughs> That was a really nice play by Escobar. Yes. He lost in the whole replay conversation. That's lined the other way by Birdie, and Marte gives ground, has to try and flag it down, gets it against the sidewall. Birdie trying for two, and he'll make it safely. So Birdie, who had been stymied to that point, picks up his first hit in the series, an opposite field double. Birdie really is a fast. When he hits this ball down the line, I think Marte had. Intentions of trying to make a great play, see the side view, but it kept working its way away from him. Now he gets it, gets off the sidewall, and didn't get enough on this throw because of the speed of Birdie. He always runs hard, plays hard. Good turn. And now you have to concern yourself with the steal of third with Garrett Cooper at the plate. And he takes a slider outside. Birdie leads the National League and steals with 25. He had a streak of 21 straight success, successful steals until the Mets got him with Nito throwing him out. And a half swing and Cooper went around one on one. Cooper's 0 for 3 tonight, 0 for 6 in the two games. He started the night sixth in the National League in batting. And hitting 327 with runners in scoring position. McNeil stand very tight to the bag to keep Gurpurdy close. Mm. And Cooper flies one toward the right field corner. Marte goes over and it's off the foul pole, a two run homer. Garrett Cooper on a slicing fly ball bangs one off the pole for a two run homer, his seventh of the year. And just like that, the Marlins extend their lead to four to one. So Drew Smith continues to have issues with the long ball. This one an opposite field home run by Garrett Cooper who dons the Marlins home run helmet. <laughs> Third straight appearance that Drew has given up a home run. Second home run he's allowed to Drew, uh, to Garrett Cooper. In his career. Just shows how talented. Cooper is he talked about that batting average but the ability to have that power to hit it off the foul screen or in this case fair screen half swing and a miss by Aguilar and it's 0 and 2 waits a long time on this fastball and kind of sliced it down the right field line and it just stayed fair I mean Really, when you come down to it, Birdie and Cooper did the exact same thing. Cooper's just a little stronger. Yeah. <laughs> My memory serves me right. Cooper hit a walk off against Drew Smith in Miami a year ago. Two, and two to Aguilar, who had a, an infield hit back in the second. So Drew Smith, who was uh, a mainstay. In protecting leads late in games for the Mets early in the season, really worked his way into the circle of trust, but the late returns have not been good. And it really accelerates the need for the Mets to get Trevor May healthy. Mm. Well, he's been throwing almost every day out in the outfield, so it feels like uh, he's going to be making that kind of rehab. Appearances soon. There's Seth Lugo up in the bullpen now. Seth trying to get ready quickly with Smith struggling all of a sudden. And he straightens up Aguilar and it's three and two.
Aguilar drives this one out to right and over toward the line comes Marte and has a room to reach in and he made the catch. That's a terrific play by Marte up against that short sidewall able to bend over reach in grab the ball pull it back. Told his buddy Aguilar go sit down. I got this one. Well, he threw him out at second base last night and this time he ends his at bat on a foul fly with a terrific play. Well, he got his hip up there on the padding instead of his ribs. He is such an incredible <laughs> he athlete. Is. He just makes that kind of play which is a very difficult play to make look like it's nothing. Body control you know. Like Eric Dickerson running for a touchdown. So the first game of the series we're pointing out that Garrett Cooper keeps that index finger off the bat. You can see it that top hand. But right before he swings it he closes it right on contact. Hmm. So probably has that index finger up to relieve the tension on the bat. But when he fires those hands that index finger closes. That's a, a real timing thing. I mean because the balls most of the way to home plate and that finger is yeah. still up but on contact it's down. Hmm. Ran one now to Sanchez. Sanchez 0 for 3 tonight. And he fouls one back off the screen 3 and 2. Three two coming. And Sanchez fouls off the fastball. Obviously, El Garcia would be next. Marlins four runs, nine hits. The Mets one run and four hits. Garrett Cooper's two run homer here in the eighth against Drew Smith has really changed the nature of this game. And that's it on the ground into the shift, and Lindor slides over to get it. And throws out Sanchez to end the inning, but Cooper's home run extends the Marlins' lead, eighth for Miami. And misses with a fastball to Starling Marte. Yeah, two pretty clean innings from Floro and Bass. And now the left hander Oker in. Marte had an opposite field double in the third. Pours a fastball in for a strike, and it's one and one. You see the numbers so far for Oka this year. Another large number, first batter faced, 394 on base percentage. Second year with the Marlins after three years with the Giants, and his slider is fouled off, and it's one and two. Pablo Lopez went the first five. It was not an easy five for him, but he gave up only the one run on four hits. That's had all sorts of opportunities against him to cash in further after the Brandon Nimmo home run put the Mets on the board. But Lopez was equal to that task, and Floro and Bass have kept the Mets at bay the last two. And Marte gets one off the fists of foul ball, still one and two. Lindor and Alonzo to follow. Coming up tonight after the postgame, Guy goes sports night. Jacob DeGrom made his second rehab start for St. Lucie tonight with three solid innings. And uh, we'll hear from Don Mattingly uh, talking about Keith Hernandez. That's always fascinating. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Those two shared this town. <laughs> two of the greatest first basemen ever playing at the same time in the same city. Rolled on the ground down third, and Wendell's got it. And he throws out Marte one away. I was interested to hear Donnie say that. He watched Keith play in St. Louis 
He grew up in Indiana, Indiana, so he saw a lot of Cardinal games and admired Keith from a, a very young age as the gold standard of defensive first baseman. Yeah, certainly a mutual admiration society. You know, when I pitched against Don, played against each other when he was in AAA in Columbus, he played a lot of outfield in those days as well as first base. And if you described him then, you would say he was more of a gap to gap kind of hitter. But once he got to Yankee Stadium, Lou Pinella, Lou taught him how to pull. Well, that weight on the back foot. Yeah. I mean, he had just a perfect Yankee Stadium swing. But when he's in AAA, you always knew he was a really top echelon hitter. You didn't know he was going to hit the home runs like he did. Lindor 0 for 3 in this game. And he rockets one down the left field line. Gonovan stays fair right toward the corner, and it's out of here. Francisco Lindor gets the Mets closer with his 14th home run of the year. And now it's 4 to 2, man. It had the height, it had the distance. <laughs> And it had the direction. Just as fourth as a right hand batter. And that makes that two on homer by Cooper look even bigger at the top of the inning. Sometimes you can tell a home run by the pitch, sometimes by the swing. This one, you could tell by the sound. As soon as it hit the bat, you knew it had the distance. And that's just whether it was fair or not. Trying to come inside, never got there. The quick hands of Lindor from the right side. That second home run of the night. And now Alonzo goes after a slider and misses. Nothing in one. Well, Lindor has had 14 home runs this year. Four of the 14 have come against the Marlins. That's still two runs in arrears with five outs to play with. Alonzo bounces a slider foul and it's 0 and 2. Pete's gone 0 for 3 tonight, 0 for 7 in this series. Mets have had only five hits tonight. All five have been for extra bases, three doubles, and the two home runs by Nimmo and Lindor. Joelle Rodriguez getting ready in the Mets bullpen. Oker to head 0 and 2. And Pete goes down swinging three sliders in a row, and Oker takes care of Alonzo for the second out. Really just threw the same pitch to Pete in that entire at bat. So two out now, McNeil. Jeff had a double to left center in the fourth. One for three on the night. And he gets hit by the pitch. And that'll get the tying run to bat with Mark Canna coming up. Second Met batter to be hit tonight. Canna was plunked in the fourth. And like Canna, McNeil gets hit with an off speed pitch, a slider that nicked him on the leg. It's so unusual to see a first pitch get me over breaking ball, miss its spot by three feet. The count is up to 59. Mad hitters plunk this year, and in this case, it works to get the tying run to bat. Um, could we get a shot of where Jesus Sanchez is playing in center field? I don't think I've ever seen a center fielder in this ballpark play deeper than Jesus Sanchez is playing right now. I mean, that's crazy, right? All right. Especially with Canna up. Canna's been on base three times tonight. Double hit by pitch walk. And he takes a slider out of the strike zone for ball one. I mean, Canna has some power to the pole side, but you wouldn't call him a power hitter. You can see Keith Johnson waving to Sanchez. And <laughs> Maybe come in a step or two. He's like, yeah, come on in a little bit. There we go. There we go. That's it. That's a little better. Let's get to the top of the 1 7. He's got the 408 <laughs> on his back now. 
I've never seen anything like that. And now that this is inside, and now Oakert's behind two and zero. Oh. So things getting a little dicey for Oakert, who gave up the home run to Lindor earlier in the inning. Nick McNeil with the pitch, and now with Canna, who's got power, six home runs this year. Canna up in the count two and zero. Oh. The Gold Glove catcher Stallings out to talk to his charge. Still awfully deep. <laughs> 2 0 to Cannon. And that slider back doors for a strike. 2 and 1. That was a good pitch by Elkert. Well, you know what you're going to get from Elkert. I mean, this year he's thrown his slider 71% yeah. of the time. Occasional fastball, but he is a slider king. Neal at first with two down. And kind of lays off the slider, and now it's three and one. Dom Smith would be next. J.D. Davis, though, has come out on deck to bat for Dom with the lefty in the game. There's nobody up in the Miami bullpen. So this is Oakert's inning to try to finish. And so if he doesn't get kind of out, he will face the right hand batter, Davis, who had a big night last night. Three one coming and the slider missed ball four and can is on base for the fourth straight time and the Mets have the tying runs aboard with J.D. Davis coming up to pitch it. Well last night was a breakout night for J.D. He had a double a single and a grand slam scored three drove in five. And he's got an opportunity to do some major damage here with the Mets down four to two and the tying runs aboard with two out of the eighth and Mel Stottlemyre Jr. will go to the mound to talk to Okert before he pitches to Davis. Well um, you can't get a better matchup than what the Mets have gotten here because the Marlins decided not to have a high velocity right hander ready. But then Davis is going to face Okert and he throws like Gary said 70 percent or more sliders. That plays right into the swing path and speed path of J.D. Davis. For J.D., this will be his first plate appearance in a regular season game against Okert. It's a little puzzling. I mean, the, the Marlins certainly have multiple right-handers who they could have had up, including Zach Pop, uh, although he pitched last night. Yakabonis pitched last night. They brought up Eliezer Hernandez to be an extra arm out of the bullpen, but he's more a starter than a reliever, and maybe they don't trust him in that spot. Yeah, I bet you he would be more of a long man. Now, remember, J.D. Davis faced the right-hander last night that he hit his grand slam off of. That pitch, a breaking ball from Yakabonis. Well, now Edwin Diaz will start to throw in case the Mets at least tie this game. Davis had two hits against the lefty last night, Castano. Double down the left field line and a hard single to left. McNeil at second. Cannon the tying run at first with two out. And JD goes after a first pitch fastball, nothing and one. So that's interesting. Yeah. After the visit by Mel Stoudemire, Oker told to pitch against type and go with the fastball. That's the counter. And he's able to rush that fastball in at 95. Listening to the pitch com, nodding agreement. J.D. two for seven as a pinch hitter this year. And that fastball runs inside. It's one and one. So the question is how many fastballs can he throw in an at bat if he's so used to throwing his slider three quarters of the time. And also if he wants to throw that fastball it's got to be up not down. Can't hear it right now, or once the crowd gets functioning. loud, it's a little harder to hear the pitch come. We got Okert, and not only Okert, but Birdie on second base trying to hear this 
call. Two on, two out. Mets down by two in the eighth. And Davis mm. takes a slider, low and in, two and one. Wow. So he threw him two fastballs. Then he went back to his bread and butter, and JD was able to spit on it. Escobar would be next, batting from his better side. There's still nobody up behind Okert. I mean, you would think even at this point, you'd want a righty up to turn Escobar around if he comes up. 2 1 coming. And JD lays off, throw down oh. to first, and Kevin gets back. Oh, Stallings looking for the inning ending back pick with Cooper coming into cover. Well, they had a chance with a perfect throw, but the pitch, the throw is up. We talked about Canada gets a big secondary lead, almost cost him. So now Davis in a great spot with a three and one count. If he gets his fastball, maybe he can start early. Remember, JD has great power to right center as well. He has two career pinch hit home runs. 3 1 from Okert. And he missed with the slider, and the bases are loaded. So after two out, Okert hit a batter. He walked Canna. And now he walks Davis. Don Mattingly's got nobody up behind him. And Escobar, who is a far better right hand hitter than left, will come up right handed with the bases loaded and two out. Tanner Scott, the closer, a left hander, will begin to throw, but it's a little bit late. To say um, to be a season changer for Escobar. Now, now Ender Inciarte will run for Davis at first base, carrying the go ahead run. Better chance to score on an extra base hit and get the Mets the lead. So now Escobar has had a rough night so far, 0 for 3 with two strikeouts. He's left four runners on base. He's got three on base here. Tying run at second, go ahead run at first with two out. And the slider misses well outside ball one, and Oker continues to struggle. He got Marte on the ground ball to start the inning. Lindor clubbed a home run to get the Mets closer, but he struck out Alonzo on three sliders, and he's been unable to control anything since then. Fans know this is their chance for the Mets. Mets are 0 for 6 with runners in scoring position tonight. They need one big hit from Escobar. And that's well inside, and now it's 2 0. And Okra looks completely lost. Stallings is going to stall for time by going out to the mound. Second visit out there to talk to Okert. I mean, you're, you're talking about a veteran pitcher, but a veteran pitcher is lost right yeah. now. Yeah. It's almost like Gary, once Mel Jr. went out there to talk to him and flipped the game plan to slider, uh, fastballs to J.D. Davis, kind of put him upside down. It discombobulated yeah. him because that's not his game. I mean, you've got a guy at the plate in Escobar who's also been a much better hitter against breaking stuff this year. So you like to throw fastballs to him, but again, is that Ian Okert's mindset? Well, 2 0 fastball is a different kind of fastball. Right side of the infield open. And Escobar gets a 2 0 slider oh. that's in for a strike. A generous call by Phil Cuzzy. That is a big, big call. And it certainly looked as though it was out of the strike zone. You know, when a pitcher is all over the place, sometimes you don't get that close pitch. He did. Good, good job by Escobar. Pitcher struggling. Step out, make him think about it. I think he tipped his hand. 2 1. He's going to live and die with his slider. Escobar pops it up. Birdie tracking it. In comes Garcia. And Sanchez oh. almost dropped the ball, but he held on to end the inning. 
Almost a disaster for the Marlins. Sanchez had that ball almost pop out of his glove, but he held on, and the Mets strand three in the bottom of the eighth after the Lindor home run. Oh, wow. Now, Joely Rodriguez comes in to try to hold the fort in the top of the ninth, and Avasil Garcia takes a strike. Joely pitched a clean inning a couple of days ago on the fifth. Those his Nissan numbers so far this year. Change up specialist. And there's the change up. Gets a swing and miss against Garcia, and it's 0 and 2. Garcia one for three, had an opposite field single in the second, then lined out and grounded out. The Marlins four runs and nine hits. The Mets two runs and five hits. Right now, that Garrett Cooper two run homer in the top of the eighth off Drew Smith is the difference in this game. And Garcia hits the changeup foul. Well, Tanner Scott was up briefly in the eighth inning, and more than likely, he'll be pitching in the bottom of the ninth for Miami. The Mets will have nine, one, and two in the batting order coming up. Nito. Nimmo and Marte they've got McCann as the only right handed pinch hitter against Scott they still have Guillaume from the left side and skips away from Nito one and two Chris Bassett was really good in his return from the COVID injured list six and a third two runs six hits but Drew Smith struggling for a third straight outing giving up a long ball for the third straight outing to the Marlins number three hitter Garrett Cooper. And the slider misses from Rodriguez two and two. Brian De La Cruz has had a huge night is on deck and then Miguel Rojas no Marlin in their 25 plus year history has ever had four doubles in a game. Mm. And De La Cruz has three tonight. Chopped up the third baseline. It's a fair ball. Barehanded by Escobar. Too late. Garcia, smelling a base hit, ran hard and beat it out. His second hit of the night. Well, he's playing so deep against the Garcia who has pop. So by the time Escobar gets to it, no play at first. And Garcia will come out for a pinch runner. Billy Hamilton, who appeared in the game last night as a defensive replacement, will bring his 315 career stolen bases onto the field. One more thing for Joely Rodriguez to worry about as he faces Brian De La Cruz, who's trying to make some Marlins history. De La Cruz doubled over the head of Canna in left field to drive in a run in the second. He doubled off the wall in right center and scored a run in the fifth. And then he doubled down the left field line in the seventh. Hamilton measuring his lead, and Rodriguez will check in on him. He wanted to, he got out there as far as he could just because he wanted to see um, the pickoff attempt by Rodriguez. Marlins have stolen 65 bases this year, but 43 of them since June 1st. That's when uh, Birdie started <laughs> playing regularly and he steals virtually every time he gets on. Hamilton takes off. He's picked off, but it's thrown away past Alonzo. Hamilton will not go to third base. Well, it would have been interesting to see whether Pete could have thrown him out and he'd be able to handle that throw. But it'll be a stolen base for Hamilton since he had taken off before the pickoff attempt. Well, the Mets are lucky that ball stayed in play, didn't go in the photographer's well. So Hamilton has his second stolen base since joining the Marlins, and they've got a runner in scoring position with nobody out. He'll steal third as well. That's how fast he is. Big jump. Boy, that throw is a pretty good throw to Pete. He was just trying to. Throw it before he had it. Yep. And that change up. This is outside. One and oh. To De La Cruz. Speed puts pressure on defenses. Can't even imagine how these teams would counter with the 80s Cardinals. You know what's amazing about Billy Hamilton? Four times in his career he's stolen more than 50 bases in a season. Never won a stolen base title. Really? Yeah. 
There was always somebody else who had more. Like Reyes, maybe one year. Problem with Billy, of course, was that he never got on base enough to steal the number that the Reds would have wanted him to. His lifetime on base percentage, 293. And Rodriguez misses badly, and he's behind on De La Cruz, 3 0, with Miguel Rojas on deck. It's got great relief pitching the last two nights in their wins. They got six and a third scoreless innings out of the pen in Cincinnati on Wednesday, and then two from Jake Reed last night. And that's ball four, and so De La Cruz is on base for the fourth time. So an infield hit, a stolen base, and a walk will bring Jeremy Hefner out before Miguel Rojas settles into the batter's box. Tonight the bullpen has uh, not quite fared as well. Smith and now Rodriguez having their troubles. Coming up when we're done here, it'll be points bet post game live. Eamon McEnany and Todd Zeal will have all the highlights, all the analysis, all the interviews. Everything you could possibly imagine to break it down for you, get you ready for tomorrow, soothe your wounds if necessary tonight. It's a lot to ask. Celebrate if it's called for. It's all there. Points bet post game live. <laughs> Put them on the spot, Gary. Don't go to bed without it. Nobody's looking for the bunt with Miguel Rojas up and the number nine hitter Stallings on deck. I would. Rojas is two for three in this game. Not bunting and he takes a fastball for a strike. Rojas rolled a single through the right side of the fifth. And then he hit that weirdly hit ball that stayed fair behind the bag that Pete smothered that he beat out for an infield hit in the seventh. And he smacks one the other way but foul. Nothing in two. I mean if you're Joel A. Rodriguez who lives on the outside part of the plate against right hand hitters what do you do to counteract a guy who is just looking to go to right. Yeah field? the hard, the hardest part Gary is that. Uh, Pete's doing his best to cover up that hole, but because you got to hold Hamilton close, McNeil is almost taken out of play defensively. That's a good slider by Rodriguez, and Rojas able to get a piece and stay in the at bat. As soon as the pitch is released, Jeff tries to get back as far as he can, but married to that base with Hamilton there. O2 coming to Rojas. Looped in the air, shallow right center, overcomes Nimmo on the run to run it down. Hamilton tags, he'll go to third. So it's a productive out for Rojas as he moves Hamilton over to third base with the first out. Well, oh, good at bat by Rojas, who was just trying to go that way, and Nimmo. All the way into right center to make that play. Good read by Billy. Gets back. Well, Jacob Stallings comes up in the exact same spot where he was in the seventh. First and third and one out. He into a double play to end the seventh against Drew Smith. Now facing the left hander Joel e. Rodriguez, and he's trying to bunt. He gets it down, and that'll get a run in. Alonzo makes the play oh. and McNeil stays on the bag to get the out but Hamilton slides in and on the squeeze bunt the Marlins had a run and lead it five to two. Perfectly executed by Stallings getting the bunt down and Hamilton races home with an insurance run. Well you don't see any of this anymore. Good call by Mattingly better execution by Stallings. Stay away from the double play. Watch Hamilton. You know he's going to fake anyway down that third base line. 
and as soon as the ball was released, that looked more like he waited till the ball was down before he went safety squeeze when you have the speed of Hamilton. Yep. I mean, nobody runs the suicide squeeze well, anymore. Well, he's so fast that it felt like the suicide squeeze because how quickly he got the home plate. But he waited for it to go, uh, be on the ground, and then he took that run. Now Joey Wendell with a runner at second and two out. Pounds one foul and it's 0 and 2. So an RBI for Stallings is 22nd on the safety squeeze bunt, making the Mets' task that much sterner in the bottom of the ninth. With Tanner Scott, the lefty closer, getting ready. Mets will have Nito, Nimmo, and Marte coming up. They'll need to get a couple of men on for Alonzo to get a turn at bat. Infield hit and the safety squeeze. Back in 1972. Got the stolen base. Stolen base. Plus the tag box here with Billy Hamilton. So he's watching. Once it's down, he goes. Perfect bunt. Nothing Pete could do. Fortunate to get the out at first. Mm. Wendell's 0 for 3. He drove in the go ahead run with a sacrifice fly in the fifth. So the Marlins executing at a lot of different levels tonight. Mets, on the other hand, have not been able to cash in their opportunities. Mm. And thus they find themselves three runs in arrears in the ninth. O2 to Wendell. And that's foul. Very nice casual pickup there by Keith Johnson. Throws it to his counterpart, Wayne Kirby. I mean, normally base coaches, when they catch balls, they catch them with two hands. He just reached out like it was a hip pocket shot. <laughs> very casual. Sixth pitch of the at bat coming from Rodriguez to Wendell. And Wendell pulls that one foul, and Keith Johnson makes no attempt at that, but he'll get it on the carom. <laughs> you know what Bob Euchre always said wait for it to stop rolling and pick it up. That was supposed to be the knuckleball. <laughs> <laughs> Tried to get it to the kid, but it didn't quite make it. What are they thrown it to security? Why'd you give it to the kid? I know. What, what is that guy thinking about? The netting has made it more complicated. <laughs> 0 2 coming. And Wendell hits a slow ground ball to McNeil. And Jeff makes the play to end the inning, but the safety squeeze bunt tacks on a run, and the Mets down by three as they come to bat in the bottom. Bill Cruz will go to right. Billy Hamilton will stay in and left. And Tanner Scott, the hard throwing lefty, will try and close it out for Miami. Tomas Nito leads off and takes a big swing and a miss at a slider, nothing and one. 75 25 you get from Scott 75 percent sliders 25 percent fastball spent five years in Baltimore where he pitched for Buck Showalter came over to the Marlins in a trade this winter and he's been their primary closer 10 saves and 12 tries and then the slider misses to Nito one and one Steven Oakert survived the eighth I mean there's no other way you can put it <laughs> gave up the home run to Lindor he hit McNeil he walked Canna and Davis back to back fell behind on Escobar then he got the generous call on the 2 0 pitch yes. which appeared to be outside and who knows what would have happened if because he had called out a ball but he didn't and on two and one Escobar popped up Scott now in 33 innings has 20 walks so. He can be uh, patient. Maybe you'll get a gift. Nemo and Marte to follow behind Nito. Who's 0 for 3, two strikeouts tonight. Mm, fastball misses low and in. And so it's Scott behind 3 and 1. That's only runs tonight have come on a pair of home runs by Nemo and Lindor. They've gone 0 for 7 with runners in scoring position. And left nine runners on base. And there's ball four. And so Nito, who rarely walks, <laughs> is on base to start the ninth inning. 
three run lead. You bring a closer in the game and he walks the number nine hitter not even coming close. Yeah well that's the thing is is that not even close. So now the Mets need one more base runner to get the tying run to bat with Nimmo who hit the home run in the third inning that tied the game one one at the time. Three on the right side against Brandon. And he takes a slider out of the strike zone and Scott having trouble throwing strikes early on in this game. You know your three runs down you almost have to if you're Brandon take a strike here. I would. And Just don't you think Tanner Scott and Jacob Stallings know that they, they know it but he can't execute the pitch yet so. But why wouldn't you throw a fastball. Why is he starting him off with two sliders when you know he's going to be taking. <laughs> might not be taking now on two and oh figuring he might get a fastball to hit. It still wouldn't swing. I'd take a strike Gary need another base runner. You got Marte and Lindor behind him. And Brandon takes a strike. Looks like he goosed that one. In there. Perfect strike too right on the corner. You don't want to hit that one anyway. Never worry about Brandon knowing the strike zone. He'll figure it out. And the fastball wow. in the corner. Another generous call by Cuzzy. Very similar to the one that he called against Escobar in the last inning. And that was definitely outside because he had it as a strike and now it's two and two. And Nimmo nope. fouls off the slider. Good swing there by Brandon. Mets have been fighting uphill most of the night. Feels very similar to those first two games in Cincinnati. They broke out the last two nights, but try to find some magic late and an emergency hack there by Nimmo. That ball was almost by him. And he keeps the bat alive. Love to get Alonzo to the plate against this lefty closer in a big spot. 2 2 coming to Nemo. On the ground, a chance for two perhaps. The step and the throw not in time. So Rojas gets the force play unassisted, declined to toss it. Figure that was his best move. Probably never had a chance to turn two anyway against Nemo. He just didn't want to make an exchange. He wanted to make sure of an out. So let's get the out and then maybe try to turn it loose. I think that's a smart play. So now Nemo at first with one out and Marte the batter. Starling had an opposite field double in the third. He's one for four tonight. Facing Tanner Scott for the first time. He has been the Mets best hitter against left handed pitching all year. 344 against lefties. And the slider misses inside ball one. Let's still need that's just that one more base runner to get the tying run to bat and you got Lindor on deck who had a home run as a right hand batter his last time up. And Martin with a check swing foul and that fastball running in that's one and one. Tanner Scott 14 pitches seven balls seven strikes. Slip of the coin. And Marte fouls off the slider and it's one and two. 
You know, it's gotten to the point, Gary, where I think um, a lot of these relief pitchers have been told this is your best chance to be successful, and they're just going to stick with it because uh, if it doesn't work, hey, you told me that's the way to be successful, but you got to throw strikes. Well, now Scott, for the first time in this inning, is ahead in the count. And Marte gets a piece of that slider to stay in. That's picked up a game on the Braves last night. If they can't rally tonight, they'll probably lose that game back. Atlanta up 10 to 2 on, on uh, Washington. That game's in the eighth in a rain delay. One and two to Marte. And that's Lowen in. Two and two. These late game at bats for the Mets. They have shown all year long that they are not going to let it loose easily. <laughs> 27 tough outs. Two two coming. And Marte bangs one on the ground. Rojas on the backhand gets the out at second. Birdies throw to first too late to keep the game alive. But they get the second out on the 6 4 fielder's choice. And now the Mets are down to their final out of the night. Big bounds for Rojas. Gets rid of it quickly, but just the speed of Marte stops this from being a game ender. So the Mets have their backs to the wall, but they've got the best RBI tandem in baseball coming up with Lindor, and then if he gets on Alonzo, Lindor homered in the eighth inning to get the Mets within two before the Marlins tacked on another run in the ninth. And slider in for a strike from Scott. Nothing in one. Door had a two home run game against the Diamondbacks back in April. Right now just trying to get on base any way he can to get Alonzo up as the tying run. And fastball low and in. Ball and a strike. Lindor in the season four home runs and 12 RBIs. Against this Miami team. Been a frustrating series so far for Alonzo, but he'd love to get one big crack here in the ninth. If Lindor can keep it going. Lindor, two hits and two career at bats against Tanner Scott. Hmm. And he swings and foul tips the slider, and now the Mets are down to their final strike. Francisco's home run tonight was his 14th. He now has 58 runs driven in. Scott ahead on the count one and two. And Lindor rockets one out to center field. Back goes Sanchez and he gets there to make the catch. And the Marlins even up the series at a game apiece. Mets never able to get over the hump tonight despite a good return to action for Chris Bassett. Home runs by Nimmo and Lindor. But the two run homer by Cooper in the eighth. The squeeze bunt in the ninth, and the Marlins hang on to beat the Mets five to two. Yeah, the big blow was that Cooper home run. Now, Drew Smith has given up 12 runs all season. 11 have come on via the home run. Third straight outing for Smith, allowing a home run, and that enables the Marlins to stave off the Mets' comeback. Mets had them loaded in the eighth. They got a runner aboard in the ninth. Tanner Scott though picks up his 11th save and Miami beats the Mets for just the third time in nine tries this season. Bassett was good but the Mets unable to convert with runners in scoring position. They